Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the special edition of the Zorch podcast. Uh, normally, we don't do a lot of breaking news issues. Uh, we're just normally kind of a, a, a podcast where guys just kind of hang out and, and, and talk. But uh, this, I think, was uh, kind of a very telling situation when we heard yesterday that the coach from the University of Notre Dame, Brian Kelly, left to go to LSU to be their head coach. Uh, we have a very interesting group of former players um, who would love to kind of share their perspective. Um, we have some All-Americans, national championships, champions, um, Heisman Trophy winners. We also have one individual who actually spent some time with Brian Kelly several years ago when he was at Grand Valley State. So we, we'd love to get his perspective. And then we have a young man who, and I wanted to kind of bring this up as well, because I think what's lost in these conversations are the players. And we have young kids, some kids 18, 17 years old. Now their coach is gone. What do you do? Well, we have one individual, and unfortunately, and I've said this to him, he's been kind of the in a really rough situation at Notre Dame. And I think we all I think the athletic department, everybody else needs to apologize to him because over the span of the five years he was at Notre Dame, he had four different head coaches, which is atrocious, but he's kind of here to kind of share that experience as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, further ado, I'm going to bring some of the guys in to kind of give you, to allow you to hear their perspective on what's going on with the program. Our first person we're going to have is Wes Pritchett, who played with me a long time ago. No, I'll be nice. Um, Wes actually played from 84 to 88. And you're, you're, you're the first guy up. I mean, how do you feel about what happened at the University of Notre Dame recently with Coach I was, I was truly surprised. Um, I mean, now that I've had sort of half a day to absorb it, um, you know, I can understand when you see the numbers or the rumored numbers of how much money he was being offered. How do you turn that down? Uh, I think the timing was crappy. Uh, you know, you got a, a, a team that's uh, improved all year. That's got a possibility of making it into the college football playoff. And uh, the guy kind of turns his back on the players and the coaches. And I've read an article that said that he ghosted the coaches for the last 24 hours. Nobody knew where he was. And, you know, at the end of the day, I, I don't know Brian Kelly very well. I can only judge him sort of as I see him. And uh, it doesn't surprise me from what I've seen and heard. Um. And apparently, I, I, you know, who knows if any of this stuff is true. Apparently, uh, when he had the meeting today, I was told that uh, Marcus Freeman jumped his ass. Mm. And the players responded extremely positive to that. And apparently, some senior leadership went into the athletic director and talked to him about that he's our guy. I mean, look, I don't know the guy that well either, but he played, in the, he played linebacker in the NFL for six years. The players love him. Uh, he's an unbelievable recruiter. I mean, we're in conversations with five stars. We were never really in conversations with five stars. This right. guy's signing right. five-star athletes, which is the difference in these schools that they get two or three of these kids a year. So you know what? He's young. He's fiery. The kids love it. I'm all, you know, look, I'm getting goosebumps, dude. You know me. <laughs> I mean, if the guy is talking, hit people in the mouth, and let's go, I'm in. Because I, to me, Kelly was too soft. Okay. You know, All, right. All right. I mean, bro, you know our deal. We would have scared that guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What's the, hold on to that thought. I'm going to bring a couple other folks in. Hold on. Hey, Tim, um, you've kind of had the head. You've, you've allowed maybe, I don't know, it's having, haven't even been 24 hours. But um, how are you feeling now? about what you're hearing kind of after this this kind of windstorm of uh, rumors and, and, and tweets and everything else. And now all of a sudden you actually see Brian Kelly getting off of the plane and actually uh, posing with pictures with folks in the weight room. How about the purple pants, man? The poppy <laughs> hat. What does that come from? I got to catch up on social media. I'm like, come on. We got purple pants already? Was that the purple? That looked like LSU purple, too. I don't <laughs> Hey. Oh man, look, man, um, I'm I'm still a little shocked, man. You know, I don't know Brian that well, but I've had many, many conversations with him over the years. And uh, my son Timmy Jr. is up at Holy Cross of Notre Dame right now. 
he hired him to be on the be uh, to be around the football team and to uh, part of the recruiting department. So uh, very, I was very thankful for that. But you know, I, I was um, I've been in my feelings today about this a little bit because you know, to me, uh, you know, you start to look at these coaches as being Notre Dame men, as being sure. you know people who are loyal to the university, and in essence, they're not. They're not. I mean, they are. It's all about themselves. It's all about what they want. It's not even about their coaches, which is a, a real shame about this deal. Um, so, you know, I, I feel bad for everybody involved. You know, hopefully the guys can go out and play, you know, whatever bowl game we end up being in and uh, play it well, man. But um, uh, it, it's uh, it's a sad day for Brian Kelly. But I don't I, I think a bigger day is ahead for the university. Sure. You know, and it's interesting because when you talk about that, I mean, you know, they'll have a chance to recover from this, as we all know. I mean, this is just this too shall pass, right? Is the saying. Yeah. But the idea of having young kids who are not, and I know this is the age of social media, and folks are kind of doing tweets and, and and posting stuff and everything. But as you were talking about, I mean, these were are we that old that we're not, we're from a generation that a coach was a coach and a mentor and someone that you listened to and 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 he fought for you. Yeah. You know, I, I, I really believe now, man, that these universities, especially a university like Notre Dame, needs to almost like an intermediary in between the coaches and the, and the players because because you just don't know how long they're going to be there. And this is a perfect example. You know, a guy who has broken the records and did this and did all these incredible things decides to leave uh, to go to another university. So, um, you know, I, I think the university has to start – uh, you know, thinking more about the players, about the guys who are in the locker room, because, you know, like right now, there's some guys I hear, like if, 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 if what Pritchett is saying is correct, they, they should be, they should be upset. Absolutely. They should be upset that he would jump and leave them at this particular point. So, uh, because that means something that you said in the past now is coming back to bite you in the butt, because whatever it is, you said, you're, you're not living up to it. Sure. You know, and that's the thing, right? Is that, you know, we understand we are, we understood these coaches to be Notre Dame men. And with that comes that responsibility. And right. sometimes, and I'm not saying guys shouldn't get paid, but the idea that we're supposed to be different because we're, we're at a different school. And at the end of the day, Hey man, life is hard, That's but right. we can win championships and we can graduate our guys. And his mantra the whole time he was there was graduating champions. Hmm. You know, look, man, I, I think that uh, we all made the decision to go to the University of Notre Dame and we all gave up something to do that. You know, I mean, there were probably other places we could have gone sure. and had a really good time in college and everybody <laughs> been taken care of. Oh, maybe I'm talking too much here. Let me back up. On that. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> so, you know, but so we made that we made that decision, man, for a reason. And that right. reason was that we thought that in life, after football, that things would would go would, would would go better for it. So, but these coaches are not making that same decision. They're not willing to give up when they get the opportunity to take. They're taking, and and that's that to me is a problem. But there's something there's nothing you can do about it. Hey, they sure. weren't offered us a hundred million either. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> that's very true. Hey guys, I'm I'm gonna make a little transition and bring in someone yeah. else to kind Sounds of good. enjoy this conversation with us. Hey, Joe, how are you doing today? Hey, guys. Hey. Um, well, first of all, of, let me, hey, Chris, let me just say something. Please. There's this thing, there's this theory out there, and I, I see a commercial on TV, that owners of pets look a lot like their pets. <laughs> Wes's dog was just up next to him. Um, and uh, the, the features that's, are striking. That's hilarious. That's about the same thing. Yeah. You know? <laughs> My only friend. <laughs> that's his name? 100 million. What's his name? Lady, lady. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Or what's the dog's name? But well, we got Lady and the Tramp going on here. All right, yeah. Here we go. Here we go. Here but, we go. Uh, you know, it's. I, I think we all are from a different age and a different time, and you sort of have to move forward to where we are today in society. Uh, the almighty dollar rules. Um, how do you turn down a hundred ninety-eight hundred million dollars? How do you say no? I think the timing is what really has surprised so many of us. Sure, we'd love, to, you know, Brian, well, the last five years, he's 54 and nine. Uh, <laughs> was Brian Kelly going to be able to build the program so that it could be a national championship program? I don't know. 
we we've come close a couple of times, but yet in the games where we went up against Clemson and we went up against Alabama, um, they weren't close football games. Right. So what you know what was missing? I, I tend to agree with what Wes said, and I think Marcus Freeman would be a terrific individual to be able to recover what the principles are that we believe in. The, look at the job that he has done with our defense yeah. when he took over. I mean, he, he's he understands this game. He understands the young men. He understands the recruiting process. He's done a fabulous job bringing young men to the University of Notre Dame to play football. I think all of those things have to be considered when you look at the next coach at the University of Notre Dame. And there are some names, you know, uh, obviously Luke and, and Pat and these different individuals whose names have been mentioned, terrific football coaches. But, you know, you don't have to go outside your family when you really feel like someone can make a difference and someone that these guys in that locker room will respect. With regard to Brian, I've known Brian for a long time now. Um, he, he loved the University of Notre Dame. And, and you, you won't deny, I can never deny that. An opportunity for him came and albeit, and I, I think we all agree on one thing, the timing could not have been any worse right, for him right. to pick up and leave. Now, Lincoln's a little bit different because, you know, they're out of it. They're done. I mean, we have a chance. Uh, Georgia beats Alabama. Um, Baylor beats Oklahoma State. Uh, crazy Michigan loses to Iowa. Sure. All Houston beats Cincinnati. Those right. are all possibilities. This is college football. It's crazy. And and how they put Oklahoma State ahead of us in the rankings, I still haven't figured out. But that's, was that official? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what I'm saying. It's it's like, you know. But I don't understand. But you know, in Brian's case, you know, I just think the the way it went down, the way none of these are very good divorces when they go down. You know, Nick leaving LSU. Uh, you know, we've seen different scenarios that have occurred, and and these aren't. You know, obviously ours with Brian, I think, and, and Link going to USC, they're big names, but there's more movements going to happen. Sure. So we're going to have to find a coach. Oklahoma's going to have to find a coach. They're going to bring somebody from somewhere. Uh, who will the pool of players be? I think Jack is charged with a very, very unique situation because Brian's won a lot of football games. But I will say this, and all of us go to the games. You know, I've seen Chris there, Timmy, and everybody. I see everybody there. This is a darn good football team. This could well have been, and I believe it is still, one of the best football teams that Brian Kelly has ever had as a coach. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. well, well, their dynamic. Of, well, well, hold on. Team has come the I'm most, well, okay. yeah, right. Exactly. I agree with exactly. Wes on that one. Was, yeah. mm -hmm. But Joe, kind of along those lines, and although I'm not a whiz at technology trying to get all of us together, but for him to not have a chance to meet with his players, I mean – during COVID, for some of the team meetings, they had they were doing they were doing those on Zoom. They were right. secure, right. right? And so, although I understand the money part, the process is something that I think we as a whole from Notre Dame wish could have been better. Because now you you've asked. I mean, this was this is what happened. He asked for a team meeting at seven, and by seven eleven he was finished. And by 723, the kids were leaving the the, um, the football facility. I mean, is that how you want to leave? No, I think I think that's to me. I, I think if you've committed 12 years to the university and you've committed to these young men and you've sat down in their living room, you've sat there with their parents, you they deserve more from you. Now you're going to be gone. OK, so that that's a foregone conclusion. You're going to be gone. You're moving on to LSU. But the young men that sat and, and the members of the staff, the young men and the young women that are members that are members of the training program mm -hmm. and the equipment program, they all deserve more from you as a, as a testimony to what they have accomplished and the direction that they want to go and the road that you have sent them on. But I mean, if somebody said to you, look, I'm going to give you a hundred million dollars and I, I need you, I need it done now. I was faced with the situation in a very unique way. When I, when I left college, I didn't have an agent. Okay. Um, the Toronto Argonauts wanted me to play in Toronto and I was drafted by the Miami dolphins. I went to Miami said I would sign the contract, but there were problems with it. I continued my conversations with the Toronto Argonauts. Finally, the Argonauts said, look, 
you come to Toronto. We want to talk to you. I went up there. They said, you leave the country. The money's off the table. The deal is done. I signed the contract, flew back to South Bend. Eric calls me and he said, what in heaven's name have you done? I said, I signed with the Toronto Argonauts. He said, I know. I just got off the phone with Shula. He's on a plane up here now and he's not happy. So to put it in perspective, when you leave one place and go to another in an abrupt way, the place you left is not happy. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're not happy. I think, you know, if Brian, listen, good for you to be able to have won enough football games at the university and to be able to put yourself in a position to really have, you know, won the lottery. Um, I just think that, you know, there's the things, all the principles that you talk about, all the things that you try and instill in these men, you know, 11 minutes is, is just doesn't seem to quite, fill the void that I think a lot of these young guys are going to feel. And, you know, we were having this conversation before, and I'm curious what Tim and, and I Wes was part of it, and you, Chris, is when, when you sit down as a head coach in a living room or on a kitchen table with parents and a, a student athlete, um, are you selling the university or are you selling you? Sure. You know, I, and again, I think it maybe it depends on the individual, but I think you sell the program. You know, and and I, I guarantee you, young players today are looking at these big five programs, the big major programs, and saying, what kind of offense do they run? What right. Does this offense give me a chance to get to professional football? Is it going to feature me? Do I go to a university that features a running attack? Do I go to a university that features an a offensive line, a road graders, quick defenses, defensive backs? Do they throw a lot in this conference? I think that influences decisions as much as the individual sitting in the chair right across from the family. Sure. Yeah. I'm going to bring in an individual who has a really different perspective because, as I mentioned before, his five years at Notre Dame, he had four different head coaches. And so I'd like for Corey to kind of talk about kind of what the, the players are really thinking about now because they've had a coach that literally spent 11 minutes with them and now they're gone. I mean, we'll have a chance to kind of hear your kind of uh, thoughts on him leaving, but I, I really want to know how do the players feel now? Well, uh, I think you kind of have to look at this kind of like three tiers, right? You have your seniors, you have your juniors, you have your upperclassmen, you have your freshmen, your sophomores, and then you have incoming recruits. And <laughs> from that standpoint, those seniors, they've had a good career there. You know, they're on their way out. Uh, you know, the freshman and sophomore, they're trying to figure out, all right, what is the next step? And obviously the high school recruits have no idea what's going on, especially <laughs> for someone who's probably just kind of coming to their home or just texting right. that week or call them, whatever the case may be. And the situation is very unique and different from when I was in school and we had a new head coach because you're 11 and one. So you as a team know you can win. Uh, I think what this team did this year is very commendable, very special. If you look at their first game, their first couple of games sure. to Stanford, how they were able to put their team together, how they were able to fight, how we, they were able to be more cohesive. And I think that's, you know, I, I think that was just really the nail in the coffin about what they were able to do as coaches to get that team together. So I think, you know, your confidence has to be riding high. Uh, it, it's very different if you were, you know, having a losing record and you lost your coach or, uh, you know, you were, you know, just six and five or six and six, whatever the case may be. This is different. Right. And you still have something to play for in the offseason bowl game or a playoff game or playoff berth. But I think there's there is mass confusion. But right now, this is a perfect opportunity for the, the team to get closer for the guys that haven't been close. Now they can talk. I mean, they can vent. They can they can get together because there were some epic meltdowns while I was <laughs> while I was there in school you know, after some of the, you know, the coaches had left, you know, there was mass confusion. Uh, there was no real communication from the administration. I mean, my freshman year after the season, Bob Davies fired, Coach O'Leary is hired. Five days later, he's fired. We go on <laughs> Christmas break. Uh, you know, you know, I'm in Christmas at home, opening gifts, hoping our head coach is in there. We still don't, we still don't have one yet. You know, <laughs> finally Tyrone Willingham is, is, is hired, you right. know, so it's, it's one of those things that, you know, it's embarrassing, you know, especially for if you've committed or, you know, or you, uh, you know, are early, uh, 
a student there, freshman, sophomore, you, you're trying to, well, what, how, how does this happen? And for many kids, this is their first point of uh, being very disappointed, right? Or, or their trust being broken. And this is very hard for a lot of people to get over, parents as well. Uh, and I think the situation is so different now because you have the transfer portal. But I think this is a perfect opportunity. I see a lot of the uh, social media, which is, you know, I think is great as far as marketing, is them is them displaying to the world and displaying to the recruits that we're rallying around. Uh, and they are rallying around Marcus Freeman. I don't know what the uh, school has in mind or whatever the case may be, but, uh, you know, the students are speaking, you know, the, the players are speaking and, uh, uh, you know, they're the, the ones who know most about the leadership and who they want around them. So I, I hope the school is listening. Uh, you know, as, as we all know, Notre Dame catching up and, you know, getting out of that old school way of thinking and coming into the <laughs> to the 21st century about doing things and handling things the right way. But, you know, it's, it's not much you can do. It's gone. It's over now. Now let's rally. Just like football, it's a sudden change. It's a turnover, right? We got to go out and you still have to do everything you're supposed to do. Uh, school is there. That's your number one priority. You want to graduate and you want to play ball. And those two things are still available. Nothing's been taken off the table for you. Hey, well, Chris, and, Chris, yes. hey, Chris, and I just re really curious. I'm curious what everybody thinks. It's a great perspective too, by the way, Corey, is what does this do now to the bowl committee or to the, you know, the final four committee? How do they look at the university of Notre Dame now? I mean, you don't have a coach. No, so so you're gonna you're gonna vote a team in. Let's say we earn the right, whoever, however they vote. I don't know how they figure out mm -hmm. who goes where. Um, but does this does this work against the University of Notre Dame when you think of the final four in college football? I think it very much can. Uh you know what? But also, you know, if the if the teams lose that lose. This weekend, it's undeniable, right? You got to move them <laughs> up. So, Let me tell you, so when it comes to college rankings, nothing's undeniable. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the biggest. I problem. mean, yeah, I, I mean, we're in a whole nother atmosphere with everything I, going on. But I think with the university showing solidarity and showing some uh, commitment and showing that they're strong in their conviction about who they believe in and what's going on, I think that helps too. Because people want to see that something is on the solid ground as far as you know, you have a transition in place. I think the best thing they can do right now would be to name Marcus as the interim coach, interim coach. You're the foot, you're the head football coach for the remainder of this year. That'll give the university time to sit down and, and do their due diligence and evaluate what they want to go. Cause I guarantee you the players will respond to him. Did and I think that's a big positive in his way. But right now, I think that, you know, the ship needs a captain right now. As we, you know, you're gonna you're you're gonna play in a bowl game, which means you're gonna be going through what another 30 days of practices, give yeah. or take. So you're yeah. gonna need somebody in charge to be able to go out and be the head coach, to to be the spokesperson, to be that individual, to rally the troops. Um, I think well, we Joe, Joe, Jack, Jack is saying that they're gonna name that person inside, but they're just not gonna make him the coach. So there's going to be somebody running the practices, but he's not going to be interim coach. Yeah, he said they he won't do that until until the week of the bowl game. It, now. I, it's Look. a I, Timmy. I think it's a matter of semantics. If they're going to name somebody to be running the practices, he's the coach during the practices. I mean, you know, call it whatever you want to call it. You, okay, you're the individual in charge. But you're I agree coach. with you, Joe. I think it would make more sense. Even if, if it's Marcus Freeman or somebody else, it doesn't matter. But you name somebody to be the official leader. Yeah, that, that's the point. Right. Well, I think well, it's let me, let me it this doesn't this matter this the way the coaching staff is aligned that they'll be able to take care of it as it is. Well, that's bullshit. Yeah. You have to have well, a yeah, I mean, that, That's what they're saying. This is a mature football team. This football no, team no, is – I'm not saying I'm buying it, guys. I'm just that's saying That's why a guy that never played a team sport, by the way. Let me tell you something. <laughs> the, longer, the longer it lingers, okay, you, right. you know, Brian's made his decision. I, you know, I wish him all the luck in the world. You, you had an opportunity. You capitalized on it. You know, we're hurt by it. We, you know, you've done a great job with the program. But I think what you want to do, if you name somebody right now, you start to distance yourself from the pain a little bit of what we feel with Brian gone. You now, now, okay, Coach Kelly's gone. Now we're going to focus on that next individual that's going to lead this football team, even if it's just for this month. Well, here's another you know, thing, too. 
we're, we've got the number four recruiting class in 2022. Exactly. We, we signed our first, you know, like I said, a five star. I was just looking at it, 14, four stars or something like that. The point is, Marcus Freeman has a big, has played a huge role in that. Exactly. <laughs> Worst case scenario is you, if you name him his interim head coach, he's going to provide a cohesiveness and an attachment for those players to not abandon ship. Because you you need those guys to come in in 2022, obviously. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I understand where the university is trying to play both sides of the coin, where they want their cake and eat it too, which is very Notre Dame. Um, you know, they don't want to commit to somebody and then slow down the process when they if they hire somebody else. Sure, well, sure. We'll, we'll and I'll see. also add to the, I'll add this: uh, the year Tyrone Willingham was fired, we had a bowl game, and we voted as a team whether we were going to go to the bowl game or not. It's like it's already a red flag. And then, you know, leadership steps up. So, I mean, if you don't have that leader in place, yep. as far as a coach that go to, it's already weird, right? Yeah, this so is not some the people, NFL. These are, when, these, are if, these are 20 year old kids. I mean, they need, you yeah. need a leader. You need those kids. Kids need to be led. Right. So uh, I'm going to bring in a uh, rocket who has also a different um, kind of perspective on this situation as well. Uh, Rock, I mean, you've kind of heard the conversation. I'm Players, sorry, is that, is, that Rock, is that Rocket Ishmael or, or is that Ed Reed? <laughs> <laughs> it's, I'm sorry, Rocket. It looks that, like it's Ed. Ed. It, Ed must be happening, it must be happening in Baltimore. All you ex Baltimore guys, man. Of course, Ed's <laughs> is a lot darker. I got to be honest with you. Yeah, bro. Good look, though. Rich with the melanin, son. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rock, I mean, you had a chance to kind of hear some of the conversation. I mean, you know, uh, individual players. Uh, coaches bowl games. I mean, what's your perspective on, on kind of what happened? Okay, so the as I man, first of all, just like everybody, I was shocked, and I was shocked, and I was hurt. But I was like, why am I hurt? Because <laughs> this is how it goes, regardless of of where you are. And then I realized that I was hurt because my subconscious expectation of our ladies university is that even in a world of business where the mantra is it's just business and that mantra is used to do things that otherwise would be perceived as unethical i still have an expectation that the university that is supposed to represent these things these the, the, this higher ethics to the world that everybody abides by that mm-hmm. that comes from that university or is in a position of authority at that university so i understood oh man i subconsciously i feel like man there's no way he should be leaving his coaches in this type of a position there's right. no way that the young men that he tells that he loves should be left in a, 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 a lurch, if you will, or there's a very brief meeting. All right, I'm out of here. I got to go get this money. That's how the world of business operates. However, the expectation that we have, even if it's subconscious, is that we don't do that there. And I remember, Coach, you guys just are, you guys reminded me of this as you were just reminiscing about even Joe when you were talking about with Toronto and even Corey when you were talking about what happened with, with Coach Willingham. I remember I was working with ESPN at the time, and I remember I was in a meeting. We we had to fly out to Utah, and we were going to do the Utah BYU game, and so I uh, I think like that. Thursday or, or, or something the week before I went to South Bend, I did a disappearance. And then I was like, I'm going to go holler at Coach Willingham. And when I went in there, he literally started making plans with me because I was like, man, your receivers, they're, they're good, but they're not like on point. And I learned some stuff in my last couple of years in the NFL that really revolutionized me as a receiver. I was like, I want to share that. He's like, oh, we'll, we'll make a point. We'll, we'll get you out here this summer. So it was like everything, plans were being made. And he was like, all right, we'll talk to each other uh, after the, the weekend. And then we'll set it up and whatever. And then it was like I left. And like the next day, he was fired. And 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 I was just like, oh, wait, what? I know there's no way he saw that coming. Mm. And so, so 
that let me know that a hey, man in, in the, the university was operating on, on a business level and the ethics and everything that we expect from the university. And I say this, I remember Chris, I saw you being interviewed by a station in Chicago and it went national back then before viral was a thing. Right. It was a national right. deal. And I remember the producers like, Hey, we need a strong statement. We need, they were talking to me on the phone prior to everything that went down. And I'm not a strong statement. I'm not opinionated at all, unless it's in my own house. I'm not opinionated, man. I'm like the, let, let everything be peaceful. Let everything be harmonious. Let everybody get along. I'm a people pleaser. So because of that, I was like, I do not feel like it is appropriate for me to be strongly opinionated so forth and so on. Man, I turned the TV on. Chris was like, oh, hell no. That is not the university that I know. There's no way. And I and, and Chris, as you were saying that, I started feeling a fire, a fire inside me. Like, I was like, that's right. Oh, 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 oh. And, and so I ended up doing that on television, and that was the last thing I ever did on television. So I was a little too strong in the opinion. <laughs> so, so anyhow, I, I, I feel like overarching that is what's happening. And this is the other thing. All of us had. A, a theology class, just going back to my first point, all of us had a theology class our freshman year. And at some point or another, the stated principles that the university is built on is do unto others, or if you don't, or if you do, you'll reap what you sow. Well, <laughs> and that principle being the, the, the out front, the thing that makes us different is I was reading how when Notre Dame went after Brian, the Cincinnati Bearcats were 12 and 0. And yeah. they were in position to be able to have some type of significant turnaround with their program. And the same type of scenario, the article insinuated that the, the same type of scenario happened. Oh, Notre Dame called. All right, I'm out of here 12 and 0. I love you guys. I got to go. And so it's like, when when I heard somebody say, if, if somebody tells you who they are, uh, believe them or if they show you who they are, believe them. Right. So right. When, when, when I even that came into my mind, I was like, man, we're doing this to other universities. And now the same thing happens to us and sure. it doesn't feel so good. Not that we're not going to rebound. We're, I'm telling you, I feel like we will be in a in a in a in a position that we'll, we'll be able to remain at top in the top tier and 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 then we can talk about later what allows you to break through and 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 be at at the cut instead of being at the cusp of the top tier being in the top tier but it's like you have to, i'm mindful of those things as well being able to have a principle that you espouse to everybody that comes your way but then when uh the god of this world comes money when the God of this world comes power, when the God of this world prestige, when it when it shows up and 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 uh invites you to be a part of it, then it's like, hey man, I know we talked about all this stuff and then and, and, and <laughs> the last, but um, you know, I got you know what I'm saying. So that that my perspective has been in that vein and in everything moving forward, it's like, okay, if this is what you want then okay, keep playing that game. But if you want to not have these things happen in the future, you got to stop participating in that and you can still have success. That's right. And, and you know, Rocket really brings up a really interesting point. I don't know if you guys remember, but I remember watching ESPN and they were interviewing kids as they were leaving the Cincinnati team meeting and kids yes. were crying, kids were swearing. Oh. And, and, and it was so interesting because – they literally did exactly what, what Rocket said. I mean, they went 12 and 0, had a chance to go out. They have a great go out to the bowl game. And it was, hey, we're out. I'm going to Notre Dame. See you guys. And the kids really felt betrayed. And if I'm not correct, I don't think it was a team. I think it was at a banquet. I don't think it was a team meeting. I think it was a oh. banquet where, you know, it was kind of the, the end of the season banquet. They had a chance to go to the bowl game. And then all of a sudden, this kind of went down. So, Rocket, the fact that you brought that up is really interesting. And I, I think that we may have forgot that that's literally how we got Brian Kelly is we did the exact same thing. Yes, yes, yes. But, you know, but also, I think Rocket's right. He said it just doesn't feel good. 
You know, yep. it's like, okay, before, 12 years ago, it was different. Now it just doesn't feel good. I guess one question I'd have for everybody is, if you were put in the same situation and you were offered that kind of power, that kind of money, that kind of quote unquote opportunity, no matter where you were, would you take it? I think yes. I think the better question the is, is why right. did you leave in the first place and what is it behind the scenes that we don't know about? Right. right. And I think it's just like any job. Right. I preach to people all the time, motivating and helping them. Like, look, if you if you want to find peace, if you're not happy with your, what you're doing, change your situation. Right. So how many years has it been so frustrating to get what you need out of this university uh, and translate it onto the football field? You know, at what point are you 11 and one? And you're like, I can't get this done here, you know, and so you leave. So I think I, and one thing is, you know, he has the record and it, people have kept talking about this, you know, this last, past year to this year about him not winning that national championship, but really every year since he's been there. And I think that really probably, you know, we're all humans and we all have a goal and we're driven and, you know, it's, it's a piece of us to do what we do that that's just different than everybody else and drives us and, and keeps us up at night, wakes us up in the morning. And I think that that is something that maybe he felt that, it couldn't be achieved there, you know, and I'm, I'm obviously, you know, that's the case because you would still be there, you know. I would like to say, Wes, you're about to say something. Oh, I was just going to, I mean, I, I agree a hundred percent. I mean, I think, I think he didn't handle it very well at the end. You know, maybe LSU put him on a time horizon, but come on, you could say, look, I'll do it, but I got to do, I got to go back you know, and, and look people in the eyes and, and get out in front of them. Social media gets on it. And I think all that happened. And he just basically said, you know, see you later. Turned his back like he had never been there. Like you talked about, he did the same thing in Cincinnati. I don't know. You know, I mean, the way that he was interacting apparently with the coaches and the things that he was saying to them at, after the – or on the way back from Stanford. I would love to know more about what Marcus Freeman said to him in the meeting this morning. Oh, that, that would be huge. I would huge. love to know more about that. I'm going to find out. But, uh, but <laughs> well, I hate I'm going to I'm gonna bring in somebody. Yeah, I, re I remember sitting in the <laughs> locker room with Chris Hinton. You guys remember him. Hmm? Yeah. He's like, look, don't get your feelings hurt. It doesn't matter. Nobody gives a shit about anybody else. It's all about the money. And I was like, damn, that's harsh. But he's <laughs> That's why I asked the Nobody question. gave a shit at the end of the day. It was all about the money. And that's who we are. That's exactly. Well, that's why, gonna, that's why I think, somebody... Joe, to answer Joe's question, I think, you know, like, at a certain point, you got enough money, right? You got, you got enough money. You know, money is there. You're not going to run well, out of spending it. So there's something else. I mean, uh, if you're motivated by it, cool. But I think there's there's something else to it. I, I have to say this before. I, I don't know how much longer we're going to be here. And, I, and I, I hate hearing my voice. But, you know, we've talked about the biggest Do you really, Wes? I don't think. I don't think <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been around you a lot. So anyway, Wes, you Wes, love not as much as, hey, Wes, not as, much as we Not as much as we won the big games, right? How many, I mean, the really big games, our record is not very good. Yet he's going to go to LSU – and play Ole Miss, Alabama, Mississippi State. Yes, yes. Every, every day. year. Yes. Every day. Well, Good luck, about, buddy. What, Texas, right? Te Texas that, that, and Texas then Oklahoma, Oklahoma or Texas. Oklahoma. Yeah. Where he's gonna play. He's gonna play five great programs every year. Yeah. yeah. So, no, and, and that's that's the uh, that's the point that I've been making about this is that how do you say you can't win at Notre Dame? Or, or whatever, but when you look at the Cincinnati game plan that they had was horrific. They played three quarterbacks in that game. They had no idea what they were they were doing. Well, I think uh, we, we we get out coached in the game. We don't. Yeah, make yeah. You know, so the Alabama game, the championship game, we had no game plan. We came out thinking we could throw the ball to our tight end. Once that didn't work, we didn't know what to do. It was ridiculous. Right, right, you know what I mean? But right. so you know, this is a guy that hadn't done well in game planning. But I've always protected Kelly. I've always said good things about him. You know, but this is the one thing that I've said. This was a knock on him. And I'm exactly like you, Wes, and I've been saying it all day. How do you leave Notre Dame to go to LSU to play, <laughs> to play the boys on a weekly basis, Every man? Week. I, I don't Every understand week. that. So, you know, I, Maybe I you're banking on the buyout of the contract. With, you know, him overlooking all that. 
I, I maybe saw you, maybe you coach two years said, and bank on the buyout. Said, uh, I don't know. Nick Saban was behind that, that he was working with LSU to get Kelly down there. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, I'm going to bring in someone who has a really different perspective than all of us. Um, actually had a chance to play for Coach Kelly uh, back in the day when he was at Grand Valley State. And, and so let's bring in Rusty Stetzer, who, interestingly enough, was also a, a – a teammate of several of ours, Rock. I know he was yep. one of your good friends. And after he left Notre Dame, had a chance to kind of play for Coach Kelly. Can you kind of share with us a little bit about kind of what your experience was with him? Hey guys, how you guys doing today? All right, good, 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 good. Yeah, Rock and I were roommates at ND. I played with Chris, was on that championship team, and I did transfer to University of to Grand Valley State. And I was there when Coach Kelly first started. And so how I got there was Coach Beck had come to Notre Dame. He was my running back coach. And Coach Holtz wanted me to move to DB. And I didn't want to play no parts in no DB. <laughs> and so he said, son, you're going to be a first-round draft pick or you're never playing here in Notre Dame. And I didn't want to play DB, so I figured I was never going to play at Notre Dame. So anyway, um, uh, I ended up going to Grand Valley, and that was Coach Kelly's second year. What amazes me, and I want to answer Corey. Corey, you brought up the best question of what motivates him. And hopefully I can answer that, what motivated Coach Kelly. But when I first got there, um, when I, the person who I see Coach Kelly is now was not the person that I knew, right? We actually, he was very, very, I guess he was a younger version of Coach Kelly, but he come from humble beginnings at Grand Valley State, and he didn't have much, right? Let me put it that way. And to see him and the attitude that he has is amazing, right? Because we used to – he would actually get me in the office and say, let me see your Notre Dame ring. Let me see this. And let me – tell me about Coach Holtz. He would ask all these questions about Notre Dame, and he was sort of starstruck with me, right? He was really kind of starstruck. And to see him now with this – arrogant face and to act like he's this and that is amazing to me but i found a a a article not an article but a quote online and it says having money gives you more autonomy and control over your own life wealthy people tend to be more narcissistic than and think they they're more able and skilled than the average person it also says studies show that wealthy people are less good at reading others' emotions, even though they may think they are. And I don't think that he, from that emotional standpoint, I'm not sure. I think everything his coach Kelly so fast that he's forgot about the main reason he became a coach is to change lives, right? Is to change people's lives and money, in a sense help to change because I don't even recognize the guy, Coach Kelly, who I played for. Really? Um, he was an offensive coach. I remember that. Um, but in terms of his assistant coaches and people, they kind of pushed him around, but he was very, very offensive minded. And, and Corey, and so I have to say what would motivate Coach Kelly? So we, we talk about um, – we talk about how he evolved from Grand Valley to Central Michigan to Cincinnati and then to Notre Dame and now to LSU. I think that to me is very overwhelming for him. Well, and then I have to blame why he wasn't successful at Notre Dame. I have to blame my group and Coach Holtz a little bit because <laughs> that, and I, I'm, I'm going to be honest, that group after Tim Brown and them left, Coach Holtz started getting five star athletes. Bottom line. I mean, they weren't necessarily Notre Dame kids. They were they were speed. They were fast. And coach, and think about it. Tony Rice was the first prop 48 at Notre Dame's history and the last. And he needed coach. He needed a Tony Rice. He needed that super five star, but it wasn't necessary the Notre Dame type person and player that but that Notre Dame perceives him to be. Coach Holtz went and got inner city kids, right? who come from maybe a majority uh, African-American community. And now you're going into, I, I look at Notre Dame as being three types of people. You're real rich, real smart, or real athletic, right? That's how I look at it. And so um, I just think that when, but, so when you get that five-star type of kid, to me, in my opinion, 
is that a lot of baggage comes with those five-star athletes, you know, in terms of leaving early. Rocket was the first in Notre Dame's history to leave early, right? And that affects Notre Dame's graduation rate. And graduation rate is what Notre Dame prided themselves on. You're talking about money. You know, cars, on, you know, Rocket. agents coming into the fold, people transferring because they're not happy. So it affects Notre Dame. And so I think now I might be wrong. I, I don't think they started recruiting more of the five star athlete. I think it was top tier three star and top tier four star. And Nick Saban are getting those one and done kids. And so I think from an ego standpoint, that might be Coach Kelly's. Um, move, uh, motivating force is to see I go down to LSU. I don't have to worry about the academic standards. I can go and get the type of kid that I want to go and get those five star athletes and see if I can win. That's just my opinion. Well, and, and that's really interesting, Rusty, because when you look at where he came from, I mean, he had success at Cincinnati, and at Cincinnati, and I'm not knocking Cincinnati, but that's not the the, the yeah. academic institution of the Midwest, you know. And so. Absolutely. It was interesting because he wound up playing two quarterbacks as well. And their receivers, I mean, their quarterbacks were throwing up some crazy yards. And so in, I even kind of questioned the idea of getting someone like Coach Kelly, who's yep. really from a public institution who really doesn't know what's going on at Notre Dame. And my first, my first thought was, can he survive there? I mean, I like the Willingham hire. He came from a place from uh, – great academic institution and there are more out there. And for those of folks who don't think that academics and um, athletics work, just look at what Jim Harbaugh did when he was at Stanford. I mean, at one point, I think he was ranked fourth or he third in the country and everybody went to him to find out what he was doing there. So it's interesting that you bring him up, Rusty, because when you look at the type of athlete that Notre Dame has and compare them to what was at Cincinnati and then now what's what's kind of in store for him at LSU it's going to be really interesting yeah absolutely absolutely Mark you were saying something no so in that same in the vein one of the the questions that that came up in the back of my mind was and I just noticed this pattern with all of the like the the top tier schools they always have an elite quarterback. If there's one thing in common, there's an elite quarterback, not a really good quarterback or a very, very good quarterback, but I mean a, an elite guy. And I used to, when I would, you know, here in Texas, you know, LSU, SEC comes up all the time. And in the SEC, I was like, man, I'm telling you, if LSU ever gets an elite quarterback, they can yes. compete with any <laughs> of those other teams out there. Man, two years later, Joe Burrow transfers from Ohio State, and the rest is history. So it's like I feel like, and just from a football standpoint, Coach Kelly believed that he'll have a better chance instead of having to play two quarterbacks or three quarterbacks. He can get one five-star guy that has all of those characteristics combined, have a a, a mess full of athletes on on defense, yep. uh, 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 some receivers just for days and a, a, a halfway deep you, man offensive coordinator doesn't even have to be special they could just they could be above average and with that he'll have a chance to always actually be in the games instead of getting to the games and don't have a chance so I, I feel like in the motivator that might be something in in the mix and I used to always wonder like with Lincoln Riley that dude, I mean, he's getting them high-level quarterbacks, but he was developed like Baker Mayfield was probably, of all the quarterbacks he's had, was probably the, the least uh, skilled one. And he was able to do wonders with him, wonders with Kyler. Like, I mean, so Lincoln, it's like, I get that guy. Like, he knows you got to have a quarterback that to give yourself a chance to be successful in this, this day and age. And so I'm wondering uh, if Brian Kelly feels like, in that regard from a just, okay, let me get a chance to get to this national championship game. If, if he can do that, cause he wasn't able and not no, no disrespect to none of the guys, none of the quarterbacks that he coached, man. I love all of them rooted for him hard. The muck. Um, I wonder though, if he feels like I can get that, that one key play for yeah, us. It, man, we I had think it doesn't matter. 
I think it doesn't matter who you get because the quarterbacks he recruited to Notre Dame, they had talent. But when you go from year one to year two and there's no, you know, it, you're not doing this, you're not ascending, you're just, your baseline or kind of trending down. I mean, but you got the same talent, but you're not being developed. You know, your reads, what you're seeing, you know, your, the, your leadership on the field, the fact that the offense, maybe it's the offensive coordinator. I don't know. Maybe it's the scheme you're running. I don't know, but that development just never happened. And I mean, you're thinking you're talking well, about three, four, pretty, five, pretty six quarterbacks over the years. Pretty interesting. Uh, one of the first thing Kelly's going to have to do is uh, get rid of one of the Brad Johnson's son, the quarterback, Super Bowl winning quarterback. Is the is the quarterback? Uh, his son is the quarterback for LSU right now. So. Wow. Uh, uh, Kelly is going to have to upset that family because there's no way that that kid can play in, in Kelly's system. No way. Uh, well, you know, you know the other thing too. Just, just, just out of curiosity, when Brian turned over the play calling to Tommy Reese, I mean, uh, Brian called plays for a long, long time, and by his own admittance, said he basically lost touch with the two other aspects of his football team. He was so mm. focused on the offensive side as an offensive coordinator that the defense was basically autonomously removed from it. And, of course, you have special teams for the three integral, integral elements yeah. of it. Uh, when he turned over the play calling to Tommy and basically took it out of his own hands, you know, you saw a difference in this football team. You know, to me, it's, it's, we, we, know, we know Brian's now at LSU. What I'm curious about is it goes along the lines with Tim and, and Corey, you guys were talking about, who's he going to hire? To be yeah. able to coach those kids. It, it, okay, we're talking about five stars. Fine, all well and good. We've had five. We've got good fours. But we weren't able to take it to the next level, and we sort of, you know, baselined. As sure. parents, Let me ask you guys a question. Yeah, who are you, you going to hire as your coach, as your offensive coordinator? And yeah. this, is one of the, this is one of the fallacies that I've seen is it just so happens that our – offensive coordinator is also the quarterback coach Tommy Reese this is what I propose how do I run a practice as an offensive coordinator and pay attention to the techniques of my quarterback when I'm trying to run a practice mm -hmm. cool. let me Brian if you're if you're ever going to hear this hire yourself a quarterback coach <laughs> and an offensive coordinator Certainly the university has enough money. I guarantee it looks like LSU's got enough to be able to do it. But mm. what you, I, but I, I see, but I see these titles under offensive coordinators at the college level. And it's always offensive coordinator slash quarterback coach. Don't work that way. It just yeah. doesn't work that way. Right. There's too many right. things to watch technically at that position. To you I'd like to bring in uh, one, of our, one of our last guests, He's been kind of wait, waiting patiently, and and he's kind of an offensive guru in his own mind. Um, <laughs> one of the in, this is Tim Ryan. Um, in his own mind. One, own of, mind. one of the, uh, the one of the things I learned from Tim was that along with the kind of offensive scheme, uh, having an offense coordinator, obviously quarterback coach. Um, I mean, one of the most important things, and I hate saying this because I'm a defensive lineman, but one of the most important things. Is, is the offensive line. And I think oh. it was challenging because the offensive line coach we had this year, there was a lot of questions until about halfway through the season. And Tim, you have a chance being the, the offensive guru, offensive lineman that you are. Um, kind of what's your perspective on what he should be looking at and mainly as for an offensive line coach? Hold on, let me cut you off real fast. That offensive line coach is Coach Kelly's boy. They've been together since Grand Valley State, and he's really? oh, he used to be the he used to be the head coach at University of Buffalo. He lost that job, and then Coach Kelly. He's never going anywhere from Coach Kelly. That's his partner. So yeah. All right. So Tim, if he would change the offensive line, I mean, what do <laughs> yeah. you think he should be looking at? Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me, and and I totally echo everybody's thoughts on. You know, as far as Coach Kyle, I don't see the upside of going to LSU, coming from Notre Dame, and if he's going to recruit better, you know, that now he's recruiting the same kids that Alabama and all those guys are. So, Corey, I, I think you nailed it when you're like, is there something behind this 
because it just it yep. seems a little weird. Uh, Chris, to your question on the the offensive line, I, you know, I, I played for Joe Moore. Uh, Joe Moore has a legacy, um, Harry, <laughs> and what in the what the 2010 era, um, they brought in some of the best offensive linemen I've ever ever seen. Um, and at the end of the day, the you know, if, if you got a good offensive line, you control the line of scrimmage and you control the clock. You you can cover a lot of warts, take up a lot of time, what yeah. have you. Um, it's also kind of a toughness, you know, seven on seven, um, you know, a mentality of, um, you know, we, we, we kind of want to hit you in the face and, you know, we're not trying to trick you, but, you know, third or fourth quarter, we're going to wear you down. Um, mm. You know, they brought in a lot of talent and, you know, they, they've got a really good offense. Um I just I, I I just don't understand why he would give up a chance to win or to play in another national championship to you know maybe go for the money or, or whatever it is um, you know and like everybody said the kids leaving those folks behind um, what are you going to tell the kids that you're recruiting now I it, the the whole move baffles me so. I think there is a serious issue with him and Jack. I'm sorry. What? I think him and Jack, man, are not seeing eye to eye. It sounds like the last four or five weeks. I know, I know BK's the right hand guy there. And um, you know, what they're he's been asking for some a couple weeks, and and Jack hasn't responded to him. It actually started a couple months ago. Um, so you know, this is turning into a personal thing. You know, what I mean, you, you hear Jack saying stuff like, uh, well, you know, I, I sort of noticed early in the uh, midway through the season that, you know, he was sort of open to other ideas, you know. So uh, yeah, you said you know, I, I think it's a Tim, personal thing more than anything else, because, you know, I mean, it can't be the team. You know, what I mean, you can't turn Notre Dame into a football factory. That's not going to happen. You know what I mean? So you're not going to have athletic dorms. Uh, I don't know what he was asking for. But See, that's what I think, Tim. That's what I change. think he wants to do. I believe yeah. Coach Kelly wants to do that. I think he wants to be known as a football coach, and he can't do that at Notre Dame. Well, then, who, who's accepting the, hey, if we get 10 to 11 wins a year, that is, that, that that's acceptable. That's kind of the status quo where, you know, it was always, you, you, you want to play for a national championship. <laughs> and <laughs> Um, I mean, you know, I, I don't know if that keeps alumni happy, it keeps money coming in, coming in, or whatever it is. But he, he's going to LSU. They just fired a guy that won the national championship two years ago, <laughs> and he's going to be. I mean, somebody's already said it. You know, he's in the SEC. Holy shit! You can't. You want to go? You want to go? Come. This ain't Navy, baby. Navy. Hey, hey, Corey. You can say you don't have to say it like that. You can say it ain't Navy. You don't have to say it, this is Navy. It ain't Navy. <laughs> so, Corey, that might be his motivation. His motivation is to compete and say he's that much of a great coach. Yeah, yeah I think yeah, that's yeah. his motivation. All right, to say so I can't go. just I'll keep go with you there. I'll, 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 go with, I'll go with you there. Now that that five-star quarterback recruit that you. you you know that where he can now have access to, I guess, because yep. might not have got that at Notre Dame. Yep. I mean, Ole Miss is going after him. Alabama's going after him. I mean, he's down the list of these these coaches or these programs. So, how how long is that going to take for him to? I mean, to build it I mean, back up, and he could be in the about championship it. this year. I mean, well, you think about it, Tim. If you couldn't out recruit the Big Ten, how are you gonna? <laughs> recruit SEC? Whoa. I mean, it's Ohio just, State was getting quarterbacks no knock, every but year. But I mean, it's just. But Corey, it might be admissions. Notre Dame has a lot of admissions that stops a lot of these top tier athletes from getting in too. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, you know what? Uh, yeah, we've been saying that but... for a long time, man. We've been saying yeah, that for a long time. But... And we've been coming so close, man. Guys somebody. on this, man, I got through. Guys that. on this call, anybody can get through there. Had to we're, <laughs> we're, we're far removed from Kevin White, you know, being there and sure. shutting down a whole lot of people, you know, coming in. So I think, I do think, if they really want somebody, they can make it happen. Obviously, it's got to be within yep. reason, you yep. know. But I think the whole academic thing, the whole standard, it's college, man. Yeah. And it's the same courses you're gonna take. Minus a few with professors that, you know, they're on their Notre Dame thing. But but also, you know, but it's it's college. Yeah. So so, Corey, what about 
and this is how I knew Coach Kelly. He's not that type of guy that you want to play, for, die for. Like Coach Holtz would, we would all, Coach Holtz would get us all fired up and we want to play for him. Dabo Sweeney, you want to play for him. I don't think that's the feeling of the players with Coach Kelly. Well, well the thing that could happen is you know, halftime, pre, you know, his halftime talks or his pregame speeches, those are, those, you know, that's a yawner. And, uh, you know, I'm not trying to. Well, up on the guy, but really, it's just like, out of this group, it seems the same. I mean, you've had the one yep. that had a chance to kind of play for him. So you, you, you make that statement. I mean, why do you feel that way that you wouldn't want to kind of, you don't feel the players want to go through a wall for him? Well, he, he was just, man, it seems to me he was more of a people pleaser and he wanted to kind of make everybody around him happy. And okay. with, the athletes that he he's getting, he's getting kids who have that. It's just that natural it factor as well too. And he doesn't have that it factor. He's worked hard at everything. You know, Coach Holtz walk in the room and the whole room stops. The whole room mm-hmm. stops. Coach Kelly doesn't have that at all. He doesn't have a, 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 a personality or a presence about him that says, "Hey, who is that guy? Who is he? He is somebody." Yeah, I think you I think you, you talk about you want this new age kid, you want these kids now, this new generation. If yep. a kid is watching a, a um press conference, right? And you yep. or or social media or that halftime speech, let's go play Notre Dame football and oh, play yeah. the right way. Like seriously, yep. I get on campus, I see the old buildings, I see the, the campus is beautiful. I'm hearing about you know being Catholic, being religious. I mean, the last thing I want to see. I already know it's kind of conservative and old school. The last thing I want to see is a coach that might be stiff or look stiff. Now, yep, absolutely. it may not be that way behind the scenes, but it's it's appearance, right? So it it, it fall, falls right in with the narrative, right? And Tim said earlier, we all made a sacrifice. But these kids today, they're like, I don't want to make a sacrifice, right? Like, this is a new age, right? I can I can – meet anybody I want on social media, like LinkedIn, whatever. I can, I can network, boom, 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 do it. I can build my own brand. Now they need somebody that's inviting. They need somebody that's, you know, I don't want to be ageist, but somebody young hip that's that they can relate to, you know, actually it doesn't matter the age. They just need somebody they can relate to a personality that's vibrant and come on, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Hey guys, I'm going to, I'm going to, Chris, I'm going to excuse myself. Sure, sure. Uh, Thank you very much, Joe. We appreciate it. It's so great being with you guys again. Um, Everybody looks great. And Wes, say say hi to Lady for me, okay? Just just let Lady know. All right, Joe, thanks a lot. You bet you guys. See you Um, later. This one, Corey was talking about, is really interesting. When Marcus Freeman was on my podcast, he talked about kind of recruiting a new type of kid. And he talked about (laughs) um, one kid – Marcus Freeman? Um, yeah, Marcus Freeman. Okay. So he was talking about one young man who he talked to and kind of got from some other school as they were kind of the number one choice, wound up coming to – wound up making that commitment to Notre Dame. And there was a conversation between him and Coach Kelly, and Coach Kelly was really impressed with the the person that, that Marcus Freeman brought to him, right? And he kind of told him that, hey – and, and Marcus wasn't allowed to kind of um, say any names, but he was talking about how he would have never gone on, gone after a kid like this. Again, I'm not, not knowing what that was, but until Marcus Freeman brought him to the table. And I think that's really interesting what Corey was talking about, right, is having the chance to have not only be relatable, but, and Wes, you mentioned this before, going out, getting individuals that are going to compete and really kind of Marcus's whole philosophy as he was signing, you know, four stars and five stars left and right was he he talked about three things. He talked about having the chance to win games, right? Compete for national championships. Okay. We're in that spot. Having a chance to go to an institution where you have a chance to kind of further your career in the NFL. Well, as of right now, we have the most guys drafted in the NFL. And third, you have a what? chance at an international education. Yes. And so having a chance to kind of bring those kids in is great. But it, it was I was really amazed uh, from the conversation because here Kelly flat out said, hey, 
I would have never looked at this kid, but thank you for, for looking at him. Can I say something? Please. I hate to hear my voice, but let me go on. <laughs> Gee, wow. Wouldn't that sound familiar? <laughs> no, but, but really, I mean, this is going to sound horrible. Okay. I thank you, Wes. Guy too. These guys won despite Kelly, in my opinion. Oh, he that's what we're hearing, right? That's what we're hearing. He would not have done it for me. That's not the guy. Now, I don't know if you ever heard Kirby Smart's halftime speech. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Lou didn't say it like Kirby said it, but it had the same effect. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if yeah. you guys have ever gone back and listened. You can YouTube his first um, uh, pep, t- pep talk. And when we were playing Michigan, his first game, I listened to that the other day with my kids, man. I got it's unreal. <laughs> you're talking about young, you're talking about a game. There's a lot of great players. Obviously, I was a very emotional player. I don't care what anybody says. Kids are more like robots today. But if you could tap into that emotion and that belief and a mindset, and you yep. already have the talent too, that, that's the it factor, in my opinion. And I Absolutely. don't think it was ever going to pull that out of those guys. And look how many great players we had at Notre Dame that became great players in the NFL. It happens all the time. You know, how much of that talent's being wasted at at Notre Dame? I I don't – I mean, there's all these kids at Notre Dame. I barely even heard of them. My kids have them in their fantasy league. I didn't even realize they played at Notre Dame. Well, I think a perfect example is Chase Claypool. Right. So so no one knows – I mean, he he does okay at Notre Dame – he goes to the combine. It's televised. Dude, All of a sudden, everybody's like, "Oh my god!" Like, you never never used him at Notre Dame. <laughs> exactly. That, Tim, that, I mean, that, 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 that 2019 man. season, he was off the chain, though. Like, if he okay. wasn't there, All right. well, maybe his last year. Have... But I, I don't know. I mean, forget about all that. The point is, you can't <laughs> tell me behind the scenes that Nick Saban is MF and those guys and getting them fired up and getting in their kitchen and has fire like you've never seen. I, you yep. know, whatever. Go down the list. And I know Dabo's got it. Jesus, I've seen it. Oh, man. dude. He will get in your kitchen. And that, I mean, at the end of the day, remember what Lou used to say? This is the toughest game played by the toughest people and the biggest stage. But it's a way to just how you say that and get in your kitchen, Wes. You 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 have some people who get in your kitchen. College is not the NFL. These are children. These are kids. We were kids. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, with different coaches, right? It is your responsibility to have those kids ready for the game and get them and motivate them to another level. Maybe it's just one, two percent more that makes right. a difference ultimately in the game. That's but my. Do you point. have? Do you have the kids? That's 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 always like. Oh yeah, you gotta you have. Know, the like kids. you look at Florida this year. Like, how do you start? They were like six and zero, oh, and then like you lost the team, right? So how much of the stuff is it motivating? Like you say, Wes, is it in one ear and out the other? Because when I, you're right. When a coach walks in a room, it should be a presence. When a coach well, is saying, "Look, I had, you know, go out there and do I this today," I got today. recruited by Jerry Faust, and we had great players when I got to Notre Dame. We really did, great players. I would say probably equally as good players as when we won the national championship. But we were lost. We didn't have direction. Players weren't close. We didn't believe in ourselves. Lou yeah. came in and plugged in our formula the first day, and he never varied from it. And he kept talking about it and talking about it. We thought we were crazy. The next thing you know, you know, you're you're doing the uh, the motivational thing where you're laying down on the ground and then you wake up the next morning and you say exactly what he said you would tell what he told you to say when you woke up that morning. I'll never forget doing that. But you know what I'm saying? But it took three years. It took three years to change the whole way we thought about everything. And then once we were there, then that ship sailed for the next 10 years. And you guys have all the rewards of that for the next 10 years. And that's where Saban and Dabo are right now. They've got mm-hmm. there. They had the it factor as coaches. And then all the other stuff came in. I don't know. I, I think coaching plays such a bigger so role. Coach Kelly's role. never had that it no. factor. He's never done that. No, what you're talking about, he he's it. never done it. He doesn't have it. Well, no. one of the last things, and we we're, we're going to start wrapping up in a little bit, but um, one of the things I wanted to ask Rocket, I, I know that, um, you had a son that actually went on and played Division One football. Um, as a parent, um, when this went down, and I know it didn't go down for, for your son, but can you kind of give us the perspective of, you know, being a parent that has played the game, understands the game, 
And I mean, what if your kid is at Notre Dame now? Let's say he's a sophomore. Okay. My so one of the things what I learned primarily is, and I I hate to say it this way, but I this is firsthand. Whatever someone across the desk is telling you, none of as far as how much they care or how much input they'll put in or how much they'll watch your your son or or your daughter if your daughter's an athlete. Never trust anything they say if your child isn't the man or the woman or like the the uh, the eleven the starting eleven or the starting twenty two. Don't yep. trust any of it. Any mm. of the academic advisors, any of the people who have all the none of them. And I am not a person who I, I take you at your word. And if I take you at your word. And my expectations are what you said is what's going to happen. And then it doesn't happen, man. That that's why that I'm saying it from that perspective. And, and this is at every university, every institution. And it's very important that you as a parent, man, you, you man, right now, I, I, I had a conversation with Rusty earlier and, and the input was great. Hey, if you're football focused, if you're at school at Notre Dame right now and you're football focused and you're like, man, I'm, I'm trying to get to a place where football is my focus, man. Get get your opportunity to call up the coaches that recruited you earlier and, and see if they're still interested or if any of the coaches are getting ready to go someplace else when a new coach comes in, see if they're still interested to leave. If you're not football focused and you're like, man, I want to have an opportunity to have a fighting chance when I get out into this world and this corporate yep. entities, then stay at that university because it's going to give you a chance, even if the chance is only – that yep. how people perceive you because you attended a university Absolutely. of Notre Dame, their perception is going to be a little different. That's one thing I noticed about people when they would notice me. When I stopped playing, it was like there was a higher expectation that people had of me. I mean, I could have been the dumbest cat in the room, but just because I went to Notre Dame, it was like there's something in them that I could feel like they're expecting a little something extra, a little extra sauce, a little something special about me when I actually got into the world. But the overarching thing, if you don't remember nothing else, I don't care who's talking to your son or your daughter, who's sitting across from you, how much they said, man, we, we're a family here. Everybody is in, uh, we, we will keep tabs on them. We'll encourage, man, the heck with that. Learn how to do that for yourself. And if your child is the, the man or the woman, the number one person, the number one, that, that will happen. In most instances, but outside of that, man, it's like a wilderness out there, son. You got to get some water for them people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, Tim, I wanted to kind of get your yep. perspective on, I mean, how the transfer portal may affect kind of this situation, right? Because we've had a chance to kind of uh, benefit in some regard from the transfer portal. But, Tim, I'd love to kind of get your idea of – how do you think that that may affect kind of what's going to happen at Notre Dame? Maybe, maybe, maybe not this year because we're so close, but kind of in the future. You know, I, I just don't believe. Are you talking about me or Tim, the other Tim? Uh, I'm talking about Tim Brown. I'm oh, sorry, Tim Brown. I'll say Tim Brown. Sorry. We all look alike. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's true. I can't tell <laughs> the difference. He was confused. Well, Chris knows I don't know what the portal is. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's all Star Trek, Timmy. It's all Star Trek. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I was I had that conversation with somebody today, and and I was saying to to the guys. I mean, my thought process would be, I didn't come to Notre Dame to go to LSU. You know, what I mean, uh, I, I met Notre Dame for a reason. And you know, back in the day, you know, y'all know my story. I came to Notre Dame to get an education. This football thing to me was just something to do to get that education. So, and it just turned out to be yeah. to be incredible for me, but. Um, so I, I just don't see a Notre Dame guy. I don't know if we have any guys on the team who could say, oh, yeah, I want to go play on an LSU team. You know what I mean? We may have got a couple right. guys on defense or whatever, but, um, you know, is is Buckner, Buckner is he going to say, I want to go play at LSU? I don't think so. I mean, I don't think, I don't think um, he's of that talent, first of all. Second of all, you know, I mean, he's at the University of Notre Dame. So I don't think in this situation that Notre Dame is going to be affected. I would be surprised if guys are going to get in the transport portal to go to LSU. 
or to leave at all. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's not what you do if you're at the University of Notre Dame, in my estimation. Don't well, run and, from and, the and, grind. That's right, well, well, but I think the transfer portal is going to be a lot more relevant within the SEC and the and the Big 12 yep. and all those yes, schools. All that, yeah. Yep. Those, yeah, those guys will be looking and, and you know, it, it'll be – yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, like I have my, my – I have a 2023 – my oldest kid's a 2023, man. Getting recruited right now is hard because I gave kids a sixth year. Yes. And you got all the tra the kids in the transfer portal. I mean, shit, if you're – so now right. the amount of scholarships for him, that is down probably 50%. Yeah. Which, which folks oh. haven't thought about, right? Because they, they gave everybody that COVID year, and now all of a sudden everybody thinks, oh, people outside of the uh, outside of the, the sport, they think, oh, that's great. The kid had an extra year. This is all not, sports. Not and great. all of a sudden. They got screwed in high school by exactly. COVID. Right. And now yeah. they're getting screwed by the recruiting process. Twice. Right. Yes. Right. Right. Yes. Well, that's, that's the crazy part. Uh, I'm going to go around and kind of ask guys um, who they think um, – the next kind of maybe maybe give me your top three on who you think should kind of take the the helm as a coach at Notre Dame. Tim Ryan, I'd like for you to go first. <laughs> I was hoping to go last so I could just say, like, you know, <laughs> because I'm, uh, I'm 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 really not qualified to throw names out. Thanks for sharing, Tim. That was great. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would definitely, you know, if, if if you need anybody to like be a trainer, Wes, <laughs> who I would first pick. Well, wow. hey, uh, hey, hey, Tim, <laughs> Tim, can you hold on one second? I actually have uh, an individual who's able to kind of make it on, and he's going to bring a little bit different perspective. Uh, Tom Lemming who we all know as this oh, kind of recruiting guru, yeah. let's say. Um, Yo, Tom Lemming. Hey, Yo, Tom. legendary from back in my youth. Absolutely. <laughs> back everybody's here. Um, hey, you know, it was slow. All right, I'm driving. It was. <laughs> um, Tom, you really have a unique perspective, um, really kind of seeing how this is facing or going to face kids recruiting on a national scale. I mean, what are you hearing? But a little bit more importantly, you know, what's going on out there? You know what I'm hearing? A lot of the kids uh, in the class that's going to be signed in two weeks are going to jump ship, or at least a good number of the ones that are looking around. Unless I think the only thing that could hold them now is if they hire Marcus Freeman yep. as head coach, who was their yeah, probably the best recruiter at Notre Dame since Vinny Serrato. And a guy oh, that wow. Can, what? players and i think he's done a great job and uh, i talked to marcus today and uh, there's no indication yet but i do know that there's been a groundswell of people coming after i know pete chivarelli uh, uh chris you know pete to former walk on uh, former player at notre dame and a uh, manager of the group chicago's got a lot of influence there and he's been talking to joe theisman and a lot of the people too i think uh, according to pete you know and i think the groundswell is for marcus to get the job even though he's only been there one year. And I think he's, he would keep the defensive coaches, the majority of them. And I know Kelly would probably bring Tommy Reese with him since that's his guy. And then McNulty, who's their guy. Uh, and probably Quinn, who is his guy at Cincinnati, and he helped Quinn get the Buffalo job. So I do think that those guys would probably go with Kelly. I know the strength coach is staying, which is important. So overall, I think uh, it could be a disaster for Notre Dame. <laughs> Kelly leaving two weeks before signing day. This was going to be – the rest of the guys here on the panel know about how great uh, recruiting was during uh, Serato and Holtz's time. But they haven't had that since then, 30 years. And now they're getting it. Absolutely. Addition, bringing in great defensive players. For I picked the uh, the Butkus Award for the high school linebacker, and I gave it to a, a kid in Virginia who's going to win. But Notre Dame had three of the six finalists, which is unbelievable. Wow. They've never done before. Wow. Hey, hey, Tom, I'm sorry. Did, did you say that Tommy Reese would go with Kelly to LSU? Yeah, Kelly would want him, uh, would want Tommy Reese with him because that's his. Uh, and he recruited him. No, he had no other offers coming out of He's Iceland. replaceable. Exactly. And I think Our, Kelly's okay. the offensive coordinator, really. And he wanted, you know, he fired Den Brock, who's now the offensive coordinator at Cincinnati. He fired Chip, who's a real good offense coordinator, because I think Kelly likes to run the ship offensively. <laughs> Reese just yep. allows him to do that. Tom, when Joe was on earlier, we were talking about just 
what in our estimation was the development of quarterbacks that would come into the university. And it seemed like they came in with a high ceiling, but just just kind of leveled off and never really reached that full potential. All that being said, Joe feels like the offensive coordinator and slash quarterback coach is actually something that's detrimental. And it should be an offensive coordinator and a quarterback coach separate so that they can focus on maybe that can be the, the, the solution for hey, getting the Barack, quarterback. Barack, did you hear what Tom to- said? Kelly likes to take control of the offense, too. So he has a lot of input in the offense. So I think there is a separation of the two. And that was he was known for that coming to uh, Notre Dame at Grand Valley and Cincinnati of having hold of the offense. And he gave it away a little bit, but he has a lot of input in the offense. Do you think that the quarterback would benefit more if there is a like a, a, like you said, Rusty, a, a play caller or somebody who's dealing with, OK, his strategy and then just a designated quarterback coach that's strictly focused on the quarterback and his execution and his getting better. Would that be beneficial? I think so. I think, you know, Nick Saban's got the perfect system by, you know, Nick's a defensive coach. And Nick was telling me he likes to bring in the, uh, you know, and he's brought in Bill O'Brien now. He's had uh, Lane, Lane Kiffin. He's had Jim McElwain. He's had Steve Sarkeesian. All these guys are his quarterback coaches, really. Guys that know how to develop quarterback. Uh, Ed Ogeron is a good friend of mine, and Ed had brought in the guy from the Saints. He won a national title with him. As soon as that guy jumped ship right after the title, Ed, who is mm. more of a delegator than he is a coach, he's a great D-line coach, but maybe not a, uh, a front man uh, as a head coach. And all of a sudden, uh, a year and a half later, after he wins a national title, he gets fired. So I think it is important. Who, to hey, Tom, who was the guy that he brought in from the Saints that, that was so awesome? You know, I forget his name because I'm, I'm friends with Sean Payton, and Sean liked him too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, he made a huge difference, and obviously they got the court, they got Burrow, and then yeah. that guy was a great offensive mind. I mean, that, that offense. Well, he's, at, uh, he's at Carolina now, right, the Panthers? Yeah, yeah sure. but did it. He, you know, when you bring in, and that's what I, I was saying for the last couple of years, I thought, Kelly should bring in one of these guys. Uh, I know uh, there was one guy, uh, uh, what's his name? Scott Linehan, who was the head coach of the Rams for a while and mm-hmm. Cowboys offense coordinator. He was available and looking at Notre Dame, but they didn't want to bring him in. And he's got tons of experience developing quarterbacks and a great guy. Cause you're absolutely right. They bring in these named quarterbacks, but none of them have ever gone to that next level. They're good. as Joe Brady. And They level off and they don't become Heisman candidates. Is there a is is Brian? Do you think that there's ego involved if you want to bring in a, a okay? This guy's strictly quarterback coach, and then here's our coordinator and, and play call. Is that an ego thing? You think? Yeah, I think for sure it is. I think he doesn't want anybody else. Although, I, I remember you know Holtz would bring in guys with for you guys and Barry Alvarez. Holtz knew that Vinny took a lot of the recruiting credit, but he didn't care as long as he won. The the bottom line: if Holtz wins, he's the great hero. Nobody thinks of Vinny or. Barry Alvarez as a defensive coordinator, but I think they, absolutely, I think Lou gets all the attention. Nick Saban understands that he brings in all these super big names, but he's the biggest name. When he loses, they don't blame Steve Sarkeesian or like yeah. blame Nick. So he's Dabo Sweeney does the same thing on the offensive side, and Pete Carroll did too with some of his guys, especially with Lane Kiffin. Are college coaches now only delegators? Is that like the most successful coach? A delegator and then every or just the, the kind of the president and then everybody else actually does the coaching. Is that the best formula? I think, you know, maybe with Ed Ogeron, Mac Brown, Bobby Bowden, guys like that were, were, were sort of front men. But a lot of the guys like to be hand, and Saban's definitely hands on. Urban Meyer was hands on. You know, the great coaches. Uh, I'm friends with James Franklin. I just did a thing for him at Penn State. He's hands on. Uh, a lot of the guys are. But you're right. There's a lot of the guys that are delegators that are great recruiters. And they leave. They let the coordinators kind of run the show. Well, well, Tom. Here's one of the big questions, and we've talked about this before. But do you think now, regardless of who the quarterback is going to be, do you think Notre Dame will finally be able to recruit a five-star quarterback, or will 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 we be happy with our threes and fours? They, you know, Chris. They can get five stars if they call. Uh, there was a kid out in Los Alamitos who was committed to Oklahoma. And now he's going to probably switch to USC. I was out with him and his dad. And uh, the dad said, oh, yeah, I grew up really like Notre Dame and all that. But they just started calling us last week. This is in May. 
the Oklahoma head coach had been what? called for two years, and that's how he went to Oklahoma. Uh, yeah, Notre Dame's Notre Dame's recruiting in the past. They're very they don't do a broad based deal. They they pick mm. a certain amount of kids and they're very focused, unlike the other schools. That, yeah, that's a that's they haven't, haven't even been touching coach, Chicago, coach. which is crazy. Chris and, and I talked about that. They come in late, and these kids have already developed two year relationships with coaches. That's uh, right. Chicago, you were right too. Now, Tommy Reese has Chicago, but he really hasn't gotten anybody out of there, and that's a shame too because. Um, Chicago's normally been, you know, a great area. Obviously, they're only an hour away from uh, South Side from uh, Chicago, and there's other areas too. And I said this on uh, my television show last year: if Kelly would go visit the top 12 Catholic schools in the country, and they're bunched together, you go out to the quarterback at Alabama, Bryce Young, came from a Catholic school, modern day Notre Dame. Didn't oh wow! Even mm-hmm. Notre Dame what? Didn't because they already settled on the kid from Connecticut, uh, and so. I mean, uh, on, the, on the Buckner kid from uh, California, but, and Buckner's good, but Bryce Young is better. And, and <laughs> you got you got um, modern day. You got you don't say. And you got Bosco in California, but in, in the DMV, you've also got Good Counsel, St. Francis, uh, um, Damatha, and you got St. John's. All in one you got little some area. Great Catholic schools in Georgia too. Don't kid yourself. I'm mm. telling you, Atlanta's got phenomenal. Yeah, you got a, in, yeah, in the Atlanta area, you're right in. What one thing, uh, Bill McGregor and I have been friends for 40 years. He's the head coach at Damatha. And I asked him, how come Notre Dame didn't get Chase Young? He said, well, you know, Kelly's never visited the school, Damatha Catholic School. Kelly never went there. So Mike Elston and whoever before Mike preceded him was there. But if Nick Saban comes every year, and all those schools tell me Saban goes every year because these you got Aquinas in Florida. Then you got uh, Bergen Catholic and St. Peter's Prep and schools like that up in Jersey. All Kelly's got to do, all he had to do now is hit 12 of those schools a year and <laughs> coaches see the head coaches and it, it could open up a lot of doors for them. Yeah, right just time. show up every year and shake hands. Exactly. That's what Saban, Urban did that constantly and Pete Carroll did it. All the great ones always do it. Franklin has is a great recruiter and he does that at Penn State. That's why a lot of times he'll beat Notre Dame head to head because he's calling the kids while the assistant coach at Notre Dame has been calling them. Mm. Wow. Well, well, well um, this is one of the things that, that it's kind of interesting with uh, Brian Kelly now going to LSU. How do you think the recruiting is going to change now that kind of he's going to be at LSU? Obviously, not a lot of academic issues that has to be addressed, but it sounds like he's not a great recruiter. He's good in the house, but he likes to play golf more than go out and recruit. So what I noticed going into Southeast Conference, I'm sure he'll put a lot of effort into it that first year, and then he'll probably fall back into his habits of playing golf. Lou Holtz did it, but Holtz had Vinny. Tyrone Willingham did it, and he had nobody to take his spot. They're all golfers. Tyrone now is a golf coach, and Holtz just golfs all the time, and that's what Kelly does. And I think uh, – I said this also. I said it to Rick Neuheisel, who's one of my co-hosts. They said, you show me a coach who's a – prolific golfer and i'll show you a lousy recruiter because <laughs> they've got to be wow. great. they've got to be 24 7 recruiting they got to recruit every second and that's what they do these coaches got a list of the guys to go after but kelly didn't want to do that so he allowed it but what notre dame had going for him this year is marcus turned in is a fantastic recruiter and the kids identified with him and that's why talking to some of the players today that are committed to notre dame they're text or they're tweeting out that they'd love to have Marcus Freeman as the head coach. So I think it's starting to, the groundswell is coming and hopefully, I don't know the AD at Notre Dame. I don't know if he's uh, good or bad, but if he listens. Very and, iffy. Iffy yeah. at best. I, my, I've been hearing. Tom, oh. did you have a chance, did you have a chance to listen to the AD's press conference? Um, if you didn't, I would just kind of like to, if you did, just kind of like to have your perspective because he talked about, how it was imperative that he didn't name an interim um, and that he had enough confidence in the coaches now that they'll be able to kind of run the ship in the meantime. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I was, I'm on the road now, so I didn't see it, but I, I can't believe you said that. There's no, there's not going to be a head coach for the all, for the bowl game. <laughs> so. the, the, there's, I, don't, I didn't understand that comment at all. I thought that was, and I've already. I think they're going to name a coach for the bowl game, but just not in the practices. That's, that's, is what they're just, talking about. I don't see. Uh, it makes no sense. You know what? I think no sense. What's the downside? Because signing you days, you have you right have a leader, you no. have a, a, a plan. Naming no. someone to me is weak. Wes, I think that Tom really brought up a good point. I mean, we're talking about we're two weeks away from the signing date. I mean, what happens? So 
what I'm saying. At least you name an interim coach, the kids have somebody to go talk to or you know, and if it's, and if it's the guy on the staff like Marcus Freeman, they're going to hold most of these guys. This is a breakthrough year. This is a great top three class. It's yeah. going to fall apart if Marcus is the only guy qualified to be. Head I mean, coach. I think given what everybody's saying and the swell that you're talking about, Tom, I don't see how Notre, Notre Dame is. It they are. It is time sensitive. And to start getting in yeah. a bidding war with a fickle or whoever they're else are going to yeah. try to go after, if they don't have something already in the works, this is a way to get a guy that you know is going to go away and be the highest paid defensive coordinator if you don't keep him. Yeah, be a yeah. head coach. The players want him. He's well, proved. He's a look, young guy. He's got fire. You know, Wes, you know, we, we know Notre Dame very well, and we know that Notre Dame has listened to a whole bunch of folks. Uh, other than us, unfortunately, you know what I mean. And these these high, high price guys calling in right now, <laughs> hey, they're laying in, and this is going to be a tough deal. They cannot listen to the players; it's what they're saying to themselves on this deal. And unfortunately, they need to be listening to these young guys because it's gonna it's gonna make this program look very foolish if we go from the fourth and second. I think they're saying it. They they are recruiting a kid who I coach here in Dallas. Uh, who, if they get him, they say he would be the, the the number one rated defensive player they've gotten in 30 years. Who's, the, who's that? Mean? And this kid right now loves Notre Dame. And he's all kid? in. You know what I mean? And he's the 23 recruit. What's but, his name? Uh, Muhammad, uh, Malik Muhammad. Oh, yeah. He's, I, I, he's I, a defensive I, back. Yeah. Used to you not know, so, out to dinner in Dallas, and I met Malik. And then he, the day after I met him, he went to IMG, and then he came back to Dallas. Huh? He came back to Dallas. He's here and, they ju- and they just got a linebacker from my area that went to Andran High School that just won a championship. I think he was like a top two linebacker in the country. And, you know, he called me today. His name's Drake Bowen. He called. Yep, me Drake Bowen, because I know his dad. He's a five yep. star. He's a yeah, five star. Five star? Yeah. He's, yeah, he's, a, he, he's a fast kid. He's Rock. a beast. Pull up his highlight reel. He's wow. fast as heck. And he goes to the same high school as my daughter, Rock. He's nasty. Oh. Yep. He tweeted about Marcus. Yeah, Lennon you know, today. to to the point, to the point, Tom, you know, for once in Notre Dame's life, <laughs> they really need to listen to the players on this deal because uh, this could be really, really bad, man, if um, yeah, if I they could. don't. Yeah, if I they agree. try to do this fickle thing or whatever they're trying to do. For them, to me, if they're waiting on somebody, they you know, if they're waiting, they're waiting on somebody. Because if they wanted Marcus, they obviously could lock him up right now. So they're trying to see who they can get. And that's not good for Marcus because he's going to start taking offers in a minute. And yep. then once that happens, we're going to be in trouble. I think he'll leave if he doesn't get that coaching job. He'll probably go. LSU will offer him double the money like they did last yeah. year. And no yeah. doubt. Kelly or. I thought he chewed, thought he chewed uh, Kelly's ass out this coach this leaves morning. somewhere if he doesn't even go to Notre Dame Fickle. Marcus will get the Cincinnati head coaching job if Fickle goes somewhere else. So I think uh, Marcus says uh, if he doesn't get that coaching job, I'd be surprised if he stays at Notre Dame. Well, remember, remember two years ago when Jimbo went to Texas A&M, what was our uh, – we had that great defensive coordinator and yeah. they were in a bidding war with the guy and then Notre Dame, he ended up going to Texas A&M for $500,000 a year or something like that. Notre oh, Dame yeah. let him go. Well, they, he, they came up with more and then the AD wow. said not going to go up to that and he let him yeah. go. Mm. Stupid. <laughs> so, so Tom, what did what did Drake say you for, before you got cut off? You were saying something that Drake said. Well, I do the Butkus Award. He's going to be one of the favorites for next year. He's a junior right now, and he was texting me his stats. Oh, he had great stats: 197 tackles. He's first team All State again, second year in a row. He's a uh, he's got a baby face. He's like six two two fifteen, but he runs a four yep. five. He's got great explosive moves. Yep. You want him? He's going to be a great player. And yep. um. He chose Notre Dame because of Marcus Freeman, he told me, and that's mm. what could happen now. He could get out of his commitment and go. His second choice was Clemson. He may wind up going there if uh, Marcus. Wow. Man. Well, well, wow. Tom, here's this another question. This is very interesting stuff. If I wasn't a Notre Dame guy, I'd be really riveted by this. But <laughs> I'm mean, scared to death. So we're going to make the wrong mistake here and, and not do the right thing. So. It's like, damn, Tom, damn. Um, <laughs> right. One of the things that, I mean, if you're not, if you're sitting in that meeting room and, you know, you're a sophomore, maybe a freshman, and, and you know, your head coach just came in, dropped his bomb on you, walked away. Um, I mean, what are these kids thinking 
now, I mean, are they thinking, you know, hey, how's the fastest I can get to my compliance person to get to the transfer portal? Or are they kind of sitting, waiting around? I mean, what are you hearing? Are they waiting to kind of see who's named? Oh, yeah, the players on the team aren't going to do anything until they find out who's the coach. And then if they're unhappy with the guy coming in, they're going to leave. I would, I would imagine the players on the team, the majority of them are going to stay anyway. They're already established, at least the first and second teamers. The third string quarterback, the kid from Connecticut, will probably leave. I think most of the other guys say the, the thing is learning had a breakthrough recruiting year that's gonna that was gonna be uh, culminating in their signing period on the 15th in two weeks, and now that's in major major uh, jeopardy, and it looks like a lot of these guys are gonna jump ship. But if Marcus stays, the defensive kids are all gonna stay. I would imagine uh, if he keeps a couple of the offensive guys like Taylor and um, uh, Quinn, I imagine those guys will stay also. So it, they could really stop this. Uh, what a looming disaster if they hire Marcus. That's the only thing. If they go to another direction, like the Cincinnati coach, he's got to wait until after the bowl games to do anything. That means recruiting's done anyway. That's interesting. Let's let's talk about that. I didn't realize signing was in two weeks. So, I mean, Kelly Early totally signing. screwed the universe. He did. Exactly. exactly. So, Tom, what, what's your opinion on, like, why he's doing this? I mean, this just totally screwed. Sense. You know how most of the co- – even Jim Ball, those guys leave. The day after signing day, even right. though the players don't like it as oh, much. Oh yes, cool. But Kelly, yeah, he could have waited two weeks, and instead he ticked, the, cut the, you know, cut the, cut their knees out. That's what he did. And that's really pissed everybody off. That he actually did was um, kill this recruiting class. And another thing you could watch is a lot of these guys may not sign. Kelly may come after them to get them to LSU. Well, that's what I'm already thinking. Another exactly. day. Who would go? That oh, shit. So Tim, when Tim said earlier there might be some personal, what that what you just covered, I didn't know that, but that makes it makes me think it could be personal. Well, I've heard yeah. that it could it be gives him the right to go after all those kids now. It could be personal with the AD. What I hear in that the AD and him haven't talked much in the last few months, and that Kelly was upset with him not talking about getting a raise yeah. and getting moved up like some of the other head coaches. And I do think what the AD said today, what I read, he goes, oh, yeah, I had suspicions that he might leave. If yeah. he has suspicions, why didn't he already have a list ready <laughs> right, to grab right, the guy? Right. Or maybe say Marcus is the new head coach. He's the coach in waiting. It didn't look like he had a, any suspicions at all. So it looked like the AD was uh, – his ego got hurt and he was trying yeah. to defend himself. Tom, is it unusual for a coach – and I thought this was kind of weird, or if it was just trying to – he was trying to boost Marcus Freeman up, but when – they hired Marcus Freeman. I remember reading something where it was stated um, by Kelly. It was like we just hired the next head coach at Notre Dame. I thought is I. I mean, I thought that was just him trying to say, "Hey, man, this guy's really good." But now, do you think he was thinking about this whole move and everything back then? Well, yeah, it might have been. And Marcus, you know, was voted the defensive coach of the year for the country last year. He had that great year at Cincinnati, really built up that what they have now is is due to due to Marcus. I've known Marcus. I, I started the U.S. Army game, and I, I picked the players the first 12 years before I left for the Marine game. And uh, Marcus is one of the guys I put in the 2004 game, and I named him the captain because even at that time, he had a mature look on everything as an 18-year-old. He was like 18 going on 30. And uh, we named him captain of the 2005 team. And so I... Uh, I've known him for a while and I know he's qualified, even though the, the one hang up is he's never been a head coach, but you know, a lot of the guys they're bringing in uh, Lloyd Carr, who I was good friend, good friends with Lloyd never was a head coach before he won a national title at Michigan. And I don't think Dabo was either. And there's a good number of the guys now that never were a head coach, but they have become, you know, great coaches. And I think right. just needs a mm-hmm. chance. And at Notre Dame, I think he's qualified. I don't think he's going to shake under the pressure of Notre Dame. He's not that type of a guy. And I think his recruiting stands by itself. What a, a phenomenal recruiter he is. He is a younger version of Nick Saban and Urban Meyer when it comes to recruiting. Oh, wow. Mm. Wow. And, and, and to kind of talk about what Tom was saying, um, you talking about an assistant coach who's done well as a head coach, Kirby Smart. Remember for, yeah. for so long he was with he was, with, there. He was with uh, Saban. Absolutely right. He was never a head coach. He gets the job at Georgia. And now he's on the verge of a national title. Guys, this has been fabulous. Um, before I let you guys go, just want a couple seconds. Let's go around. 
Um, let's see who folks are talking about could possibly replace Brian Kelly at uh, Notre Dame. Let's go ahead and go with Tim Ryan as we started through first. Who do you think? Top three. Uh, yeah, I, I just go with one, Marcus. That's the only okay. person that I know. And... Okay. <laughs> All right. Outside of Marcus. Yeah, and, and, but the recruiting, I, th- I think that's that's huge continuity. They still have a shot at national championship, you know. Mm-hmm. That's, I guess what Tom was saying, you know, the, to have one of the best recruiting classes that we've had in however long, I mean, that's 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 king. You know, how, how do we preserve that? Okay, Rusty, what do you think? Top three? Well, yeah, I'd say Marcus, number one. But, you know, me looking at boards and Facebook and Twitter, people had threw Urban Meyer's name in there. They threw Lane Kiffin's name in there. Um, and the guy from Cincinnati. So, you know, I guess those are top four. Okay. Rocky, what do you think? Well, shucks. Marcus and then everybody else is a is a myth to me because I don't really follow <laughs> it that much, so I can't just pretend. <laughs> I, I'm just going to uh, pass, pass it on to uh, your, your next choice. <laughs> <laughs> Corey, all right, fair enough. Uh, you know, I'm, th- I'm thinking Marcus, obviously, I think it's, it's kind of the bias for Marcus. Uh, you think about Luke Fickle at, at Cincinnati, but then it's the same kind of scenario where you're poaching somebody from a from an undefeated team who's in the playoffs. So I, you know, I would figure his goals are to, you know, win a ta- national championship. And then I think there's a mystery dark horse there, you know, possibly, you know, someone that we're not thinking about, you know. Okay. That's all I got, Tim, but Tim I think you. Oh, yeah, you know, uh, obviously, Mark is. Uh, um, um, I did read today that Jack said that they have. He's got oh. many calls about uh, about the job. So you know, like like Corey just said, I'm sure there's somebody out there that we're not thinking about that they think may be good for the job. But uh, you know, to me, it's Mark. It's a nobody at this particular point because I think this is not just about coaching. This is about recruiting. And uh, if you lose that, you're going to lose Notre Dame football for the next four, five, six years. And, um, you know, that, that, that's going to be a problem. But, you know, Fickle is certainly, I think, in the mix. Uh, but this kid, the, the guy out of uh, Ohio State, I mean, uh, Iowa State, uh, Matt, uh, I forget his last name. They, they're they're pretty Campbell. high on him. Uh, everybody's talking about him also. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a tough, tough call for Notre Dame. At the same time, it's a very easy call for him. There you go. Wes, what are you thinking? That's funny. I, I'm exactly where Tim is. I, I think Marcus Freeman, for all the reasons that have been mentioned, I mean, the funny thing is my kids my kids follow this stuff closer than I do, and they were telling me two months ago, Dad, I think Brian Kelly's going to leave and Marcus. it's going to be Marcus Freeman's show. I swear Jeez. to God. I can't make up. I, I'm telling you. Um. And I, I just think the, kid, the kids love him. The players love him. He's a proven recruiter. He's obviously a good defensive coordinator. He's got fire. He played linebacker in the NFL for six years. I mean, he, he's a guy, right? He's not some uh, pretentious dude that sits up on in the press box. I mean, he's a player's coach. Uh, I think the recruiting – I think we've built a lot of momentum in recruiting and, and, and the um, – you know, and, and the people expecting Notre Dame to be, uh, you know, at the, at the top tier every year. I think this – I'll honestly say, I think as a coaching staff, the the growth of the team this year was the best coaching job I've seen at Notre Dame mm-hmm. until he's been there. To watch those kids, the offensive line gel, sure. the defense come yeah. together. Development. The back game confidence, the play calling improving on offense. The tackling got better. I mean, they're not the team that played Stanford would beat the shit out of Cincinnati now. And right. Right. Oh, right. 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 could beat Notre Dame right. anymore. That's my yeah. whatever. But then I think Pickles an even an obvious choice. But I think if you start thinking about the signing date being two weeks, you that guy can't commit until after the bowl game. Right. He's post uh, you know, the signing date, which presents mm-hmm. a lot of problems. And then I think the Iowa State guy would do a great job. If you can win in a place like Iowa State. You can win anywhere. Uh, I love coaches like that from a smaller, ben, you know, smaller uh, market. Um, and you know, other than that, I think that's that's a deal. But I, I think I'm actually after listening to this call and thinking about it more. I'm more inclined to 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 you know hope that Marcus Freeman is the guy. I hope that Schwarberg has a huge ego, makes oh. the right decision, and doesn't say that he's explored all his options and. 
You know, that fucker never put, suited up and put on a chin strap. I can tell you that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's a checkers playing, chess playing, pipe smoking. He ain't a football guy. All right. Thank you, Wes. How about Tom? Talk to us about what do you think your top three may be. You know, I think we should have had Wesley's uh, kid as uh, AD. He knew that kid. Kelly- <laughs> Right. 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 I need to talk to you about my kids. I got a junior and a sophomore. I need to talk to you. About well, let me know. You know, I travel, I travel the whole country, so I see everybody in person, and I'm doing a big thing uh, all over every state. So, I do. what state do you live in? <laughs> South Carolina. I'll send you their. Hi- you know what? Can I? I'll get your contact info from Chris. I'll send you some information. Yeah, because um, I did one at. Uh, I did one for Shane Beamer back on September 25th. And my oldest kid got hurt as a sophomore. He was all state as a freshman, and they just ranked him tenth in South Carolina. Wow, that's great. Oh. And uh, uh, at least uh, for me, for me figure skating or what? What is this? It's Marcus. <laughs> 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 I think there's, there's, there's ice in South Carolina. 12, 12, 1,200 yards on offense, 115 tackles. I mean, what else do you want? <laughs> Wes, really, Wes? And we're okay, trying David. to find out what the hell is going on here at Notre Dame. And that <laughs> uh, hey, wow. if you're not, hey, Chris, always be selling. Always. Wow. <laughs> apparently, apparently. All right, again, this is not the, the, the Wesley Preacher Kids show. Tom, again, what do you think is top three? Oh, I would. Marcus would be number one, and then I, Urban would be a great choice. But he's had some problems that the press. <laughs> I, yeah, man, that is. Always talked about wanting to be Notre Dame's head coach, but I think it's that ship has sailed. Yeah. Uh, Campbell is kind of a scatterbrain. He's a great coach, but recruiting wise, at Iowa State, uh, it's really a, a wild card if he's going to do well or not because never recruits the good players. And I don't know if his staff is capable because you always got to bring guys that know how to go after five stars like Marcus. There are very few of them. Alabama seems to have five or six. Clemson does. Georgia and Notre Dame's got Marcus right now. The only guy that can actually land five star players. So I would go with him. And I, and I think all of the guys, you know, um, Pickle, Luke is Luke Pickle's a good uh, choice, but I think Marcus is head and shoulders above everyone else. Okay. Hey, well, Tom, I got a nephew that plays uh, for the Dakota West. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Are hold on, you familiar? Hold on, hold on. Wrestling, hold on, hold on. Come on, man. We're oh. just not recruiting. You know, you know wait, 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 I'm going to be I'm gonna be at Lakota East High School uh, next week. He's, the, he's at Lakota okay, well, West. Okay. Right, his right, name right, is right. Joshua Rusty, Rusty, Fussell. Okay. Really? Rusty, all right, come on now. <laughs> Let me know right, about so, it. Wow. We, we are out of control now. All right. So, <laughs> thank you very much, Rusty. Dude, you don't know how hard it is to get kids recruited these days. <laughs> no. <laughs> Tell them about it. I know. Wes just want a little feedback. Well, give have some well, I will give it to time. I will give it to time. All right. So, <laughs> I want to wind up. I want to wind up now. By, so, I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit here and say, if not Marcus Freeman, who I definitely think is capable, I'm going to throw out a name here. It's going to jack everybody up here. What about Andy Heck? And he's still coaching? There we go. See? Well, Andy is the offensive line coach for the Chiefs. Absolutely. For the Kansas City Chiefs. Kicking ass. Tom, yeah, wait, what do you think about Marcus? Great. Well, I, let, you know what? Let me, let let me respect the old player. I'll coach inside linebacker. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, you know, Wes. What I, said to, what, I said to, <laughs> what I said to a few people today is that, and I, I said this early on to you guys about, I was all in my feelings about this because, you know, you think you have a relationship with a guy and all of a sudden you realize that relationship means nothing. You know, and I, I, I said, and I, I mentioned that Notre Dame needed an intermediary. If they're going to hire guys who are not Notre Dame guys, they need to hire an intermediary, somebody to be uh, in between the coaches and the players so these, these guys can understand what this thing is all about because these guys are there for a minute and gone. You know, if Andy Heck is available, I would totally support that. You know what I mean? Simply because – now, I hate the fact that we would lose recruits and all that, but one day Marcus is going to be gone too. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Like <laughs> He's not going to be there Andy for Heck didn't leave You it. know that. You know what I mean? So uh, I, I just think, man, if Andy Heck is available – I would love to see that happen because I think you at a place like Notre Dame, man. I yeah. think that's why I thought Charlie White was going to be incredible, but it turned out he couldn't coach. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? He couldn't recruit. I mean, that's a bad thing if you're going to be in college football. So I, I just think if that's if that's a, a real deal, I mean, I would support it if, if it happened. 
No, I know. Now, I don't have any inside secrets. I didn't talk to anything. I just thought that it would be great to have someone at the helm that actually Rumor led started. and sweated and understood that what Notre Dame football was about. So, guys, this has been well, absolutely terrific. Pissed off half of Kansas City. So, <laughs> <laughs> I would just ask. Yeah, I, guess I would just right, ask right. that these uh, college football Hall of Famers and NFL Hall of Famers, you know, if they're able to talk with the football administration about getting more Notre Dame football alumni back on the field. You know, I look at schools like Miami, Alabama, they're damn near coaching when they come back <laughs> to the school. Kelly, you know, it'd be great for us to have some presence in the actual stadium instead of being forced to go sit down in a, in a seat, you know, because I, hmm. you know, I feel like that's great for recruiting. That's great for, you know, for the guys to see former players come back. I always loved it when I was there, you know, because it's now it's like, oh, snap, that's a legend right there. That's somebody that right there. Like, that was cool to me, you know, but I also well, Corey, get it. That's, that's, that, no, no, that's a very interesting topic because I've had a chance to be involved for a while. And really when Tyrone Willingham was there, when I was in law school at Notre Dame, um, I went and talked to recruits. I went and hung out with them. I mean, I would really had a chance to kind of be involved. But after him, it, it was just an issue. Um, I don't know if – I'm not going to speak for anybody else, but it was a challenge trying to get uh, – tickets was a challenge of trying to get involved and say, you know, hey, there's a kid from Chicago. Um, I know there are former players who live in the South Bend area who have been trying to – dying to get involved with the program – but have almost been kind of, you know, not really have had that conversation. And when I was an employee there, uh, Reggie and I worked on a pro. Reggie Brooks and I worked on a program that we presented to our ticket office because Corey, just what you're saying, we were watching the game. Miami was playing somebody, and there was a whole section of former Miami players. Yeah. And so Reggie and I were like, "Hey, man, let's see, if we can do that." And so we actually gave a proposal to the ticket office and they said no nah, we couldn't do it we would upset the other sports if we had all of them sitting next together oh yeah that doesn't hey, man. Bad, this this is what it and so but but this is part of this culture that for years we've been fighting right so before me it may have been some other guys that were trying to get involved and it just they almost got but stopped it, it turns the front door. it turns players off and it, and it stops players from coming. And I say that from, you know, personal experience. And I talked to a number of players and they're like, well, I'm not going back because I was treated like this or this was done or this. Sure. Was done. And that hurts yeah. your program because and, that's and, and here's, here's, here's another thing, Corey, I don't mean to cut you off here, but I was going through some files and I don't know if you guys remember getting them, but I, I, I found my letter. I kept it in the file because I couldn't believe it from Coach Weiss when he sent it out to all the former football players and said that there was a there. There's been some issue with the football program and, and alumni of the football program, but we seemed to solve it. And the, the problem was Stan um, Stan Wilcox, who was the football administrator. He literally threw Stan under the bus and said the reason that there was a miscommunication between Stan and the former players. And I, I just I was appalled at that. My, needless to say, Stan wound up becoming the the athletic director of Florida State, and is currently now like the number three guy at the NCAA. So, I mean, he obviously knows what he was doing. But the challenging thing is that when you come from a, a great program like this, a great you know athletic and academic institution, and you're not invited back or you're not welcomed back, that's a challenge. It is a challenge because why not? Why can't you stand on the sideline? Why can't you stand there? There's no yeah, one else there. Be like right? that. When everybody else has left the field, when all the, the mystery individuals are out there, no disrespect to them. You know, I'm sure they're, <laughs> no, exactly. they're great contributors to the university. The, exactly, no the high donors. To anybody, right? But I think it's just, you know, it, it's, it's disrespectful. To well, and, 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 and here's the thing, Corey. They're going to say it's, it's a risk management issue, which is what we heard. But it's okay yeah. for every other school to yeah. have their players hanging out on the yeah. sideline, right? I, I did you see the old Miss – no, did you see I, the Auburn game, Alabama game? Yeah. Oh my God! There was there, there was hardly any grass on the sideline. There was people standing everywhere. Dude, I, I grew up in Atlanta, and I've been going to Georgia games, you know, on and off for the last twenty five years. Their last national championship was nineteen eighty. 
they walk those guys out like they are gods on that stage. They have their own box. They're on the sidelines. We have our – we're the last national championship. We go back to school for like the 30th reunion, and they start nickel and diamond me about my uh, – per person at the tailgate, how much I got to pay for my kids to have a fucking hot dog. <laughs> I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> yeah. You know I'm right. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. tickets. I don't care. Oh, yeah. But you think those guys at Georgia are paying for their tickets? Or they pay for their hotel rooms. God. They put up a party for the team paid by the school. Hey, hey, Wes. Hey, Wes, Wes I don't be an asshole, but them, those guys are working them. for you now. So, I, you know, a little bit different. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, there. it wasn't until <laughs> Reggie Brooks uh, was involved with the uh, the um, monogram uh, monogram department. Uh, if I came back, I had nowhere to sit. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was the was, trophy winner. It, it was it was really mm. tough, man. I mean, I had to literally go through people I knew to get tickets for right. a game. You know I mean? It was it, they just didn't they just didn't pay attention for it. And it wasn't until I, I threatened like to like do something crazy, like something none Tim Brown like. That's, that's that so they, stupid, man. It's, they, it's... they got like, oh, oh, you you mean you want to be in the suite every time you come? Yes, and whoever I'm with too. All right, <laughs> I, I don't want no tickets, nothing. I just want to be able to walk in. Now, what's your say? Tom, this is. I mean, I, I'm sure you've heard some of these stories, Tom. But I mean, do you hear stories like this? At, at other schools? I mean, are we no. just a unique place no. that has this great tradition New and all Mexico of a sudden State. the players are, are, are welcomed all the time? Stanford, Stanford's so, similar to Notre Dame, but all the, you go into Southeast Conference where you guys, some of you guys live, it's a complete different world. They, they oh. do everything recruiting. Too, so they do want past stars to come out there. I was with um, Bear Bryant's grandson a couple weeks ago, uh, whose son, whose his own son is the number two quarterback at Alabama. So we we're on site. It was all former players, Major Ogilvy, uh, a lot of the guys I had seen from the were there that I had known. So the whole sidelines was full of former players at Alabama. So they they understand the significance of bringing back the former stars and the ball players, and because obviously then these are guys that can talk to the ball players while they're there, the recruits, and that's everything's about recruiting. You only win and you only get uh, fourteen million dollars a year. By recruiting great players, and I, I believe Kelly's going to fail after a couple of years. Uh, you know, Brown's no, got yeah. great players there, so he's going to win. It reminds me, Houston Nuts, my co-host now, and Houston is a great coach, but he was a bad recruiter. He got to Ole Miss. He had two real good years, and all of a sudden, Ogier and guys, his guys started uh, retire, leaving, and obviously, uh, he couldn't win a Southeast Conference game his last two years. And that's going to be the same. Kelly is going to be playing golf a lot. And when Ogeron's guys guys leave at LSU, Kelly, in that conference with Texas and Oklahoma coming in around that time, Kelly's got them in his own conference. He's got Alabama. Mike Leach, who I was with last week, uh, is a very good coach, and he could beat LSU when he wants to also in Ole Miss. So Kelly's got a tough game. Unlike Notre Dame, he's got a tough game every game. And mm. Notre Dame could, you know, play balls. Or they could play, uh, you know uh, – Purdue or some guys that aren't Southeast Conference material. And not to mention, I think his personality and the uh, fan base at LSU is oil and water. Yeah, exactly. Big time. Big time. Well, obviously some of you have to think so. The, the, the AD <laughs> wound up extending him an amazing contract. I believe he got, you know, somewhere in the range of 98 million for 10 years. Uh, guys, this has been absolutely terrific. I'm glad we were able to kind of reach out. I was able to reach out and, and grab you guys, kind of talk about this topic. This is something that's near and dear to all of our hearts. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I, I think we could kind of see the passion that everyone has for a place that we've been gone from, some of us, 20, 30 years. And in Joe's case, even more than that. So the idea that we still kind of care about this place um, really resonates with me, which is why I kind of wanted you guys to kind of give your kind of two cents about how you felt about what went down with, with Coach Kelly. So thank you guys very much. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Thanks, 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 Thanks for all y'all. I see you brothers. Thank you guys. You guys look great. Keep it up. All right, gentlemen, hey, as always, go Irish. Yes, sir. Go Tim, Irish. I'll make sure I uh, check you out when you come to Dallas. I saw your, uh, your DM. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm gonna be there. We're filming. I got my camera crew coming, so we're gonna film I'll, on that day. So I'll 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 give the exact time. We're gonna. The coach is over at Desota. Is a good friend of mine. So we're gonna have one, at least one cameraman come by there for film part of the show. I love. I live, to, right, I I live right in Cedar Hill, Tom. So look me up. We'll get you on there too. That'd be great. I got to holler at you two guys. I moved to Dallas last summer, so oh, and I've been oh, back and oh, forth to there? Chicago. Oh, I didn't know it's been it's been crazy, man. It's been crazy. Oh, give me your number. So. Or give Chris your number, and I'll um, I'll give you a call about when we're coming yeah. down. We should all roll through. Sounds, Sounds good. good. Sounds great. Yeah. Okay, guys. All right, be good. all right, y'all. Thanks, guys. All right, guys. I, I would like to thank everyone who had a chance to tune in on Facebook, um, Twitter, and also YouTube. Uh, just wanted to kind of show who we were um, outside of our helmets um, to understand that after, as I said, in the 30, 40 plus years, we still have this passion for our university. And as I think you, you could hear what guys were saying over the, the hour plus time we were there is that they understood, they could probably understand why he wanted to leave for the money, but it was the way he did it. It was the way he didn't really kind of talk to a lot of people doing it. And again, that's his prerogative. But I think what happens is that we all have a chance to kind of see and understand how important something like this, being a leader, um, being a leader of men, kind of uh, um, how that's still important for folks. And it's definitely important for us. So again, thank you guys very much. I'm going to give you a last couple of minutes. Um, I host a Super 16 poll show, which I will break down the top 16 teams in the country. It's going to be our last show. It's going to be December 6th on Monday night at 7 p.m. on all these channels that you're watching. So here's a little promo for it. Um, again, thank you guys very much for tuning in, and I look forward to kind of seeing you again. Super 16 is the cream of the crop. College football time of year, don't stop. We're We're adding this guy. Just another go down with the courage. Hard skill and will. Bringing you the best 16. Serving up a place for the football fiends. Breaking the best 16 college teams. Football fans, it's the show where you dream. Ain't no bias. Chris Zorris ranking truth. Traded in the golden helmet in the past for a suit. With the tape, never lie. College ball, he's a stoop. Breaking the top 16, not the top 32. I don't mean to cut you off like a Zorvis jersey, but you ain't really grinding unless the jersey dirty. Hit the running back like a Mack truck behind the 30 yard line. It's game time. My team riding off the side. You look line. at Chris like this with a fact checklist. Going over college teams like a big scientist. Steve streaking from his head like in his playing days. Super 16 poles on the show straight away. It's the FBS, the best of the best from the ACC to the SEC. Pac 12, Big 10, Mount West, Sun Belt, and the Big 12. Open your eyelids. Who the best we like the clock. clock? Super 16 is the cream of the crop. College football time of year, don't stop. With Christopher Zurich, just another go down with the courage. Hard skill and will, bringing you the best 16. Serving up a plate for the football fiends. Breaking the best 16 college teams. Football fans, this is the show where you dreams.